I am nervous as all hell, but I am super, super excited to be here and cast some arena with you guys. This is, it's been a little dream and I'm super, super happy to be here. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a little bit, uh, you know, some tech issues there, but uh, I can only speak for myself, Lithy. This is our, I think, second time casting together, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's been a pleasure in the past, and I'm sure it's going to be a pleasure this weekend as well. Uh, super excited to have you here with us, of course. Um, and here we have a quick uh, look at the uh, format. So we did cup number one. That's already happened. Now is cup number two. Teams uh, who are top three. After this weekend, they will be guaranteed a spot for that mid-season clash. However, the teams who are in 4th to 11th position, 4th uh, to 11th, 4th to 8th position, sorry, uh, those guys will be fighting in the gauntlet. So uh, we're going to have the gauntlet, then we're going to have the mid-season clash, um, and uh, today we're deciding who gets to go. Yeah. Hello, I'm back. I think I'm good. Thank God. Um, microphone, <laughs> my <back>. microphone <laughs> cursed me. Hopefully, hopefully everybody can hear me now. Sorry about that. Uh, but you know, let's able to see without a little bit of muting. But yeah, Zico, you kind of already covered it. But uh, time is running out for these teams. Pressure is certainly on here. Uh, we've got some returning teams: Hulabang, Lava, Lava. We know those two teams as the teams that were in the finals, of course. And then Echo down there in third place uh, with 120 points. But I mean, that's really the huge story, Ven from last weekend is these two teams that we haven't seen yet in the AWC just absolutely dominating here in Europe. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I think this week's going to be all about, was it a fluke? Like Hulabang and Lava Lava, was it one of those tournaments, uh, you know, once in a lifetime performance? Or are they going to come into cup number two and be able to have that repeat success? You know, both of them being in the top eight so far, uh, I think is a great start for them. But I think most people expect Echo to kind of have a redemption <laughs> in this cup number two, they've been such a dominant team. The fact that they lost and were eliminated in third place last week, I think was a massive upset. Also, another interesting one is Wandering Water Furbogs. Um, they're in a position right now where they might not even make top eight. That's Swapsy's team. And that is something I would have never anticipated. So as the day kind of unfolds, we'll be able to see if that happens. Yeah, I'm excited for today for sure. Um, we are going to be, uh, unfortunately, not seeing them. So that's, I mean, I feel like Europe just kind of got turned on its head a little bit. Really kind of crazy what's going on here. We are seeing two new teams as well in the first matchup of the day, Lithy. We've got Precog Enthusiasts versus Punch Squad. Uh, so, you know, we, we saw what happened with new teams last week, and I wonder if we're going to see some of that success repeat here for this weekend. Yeah, I'm super, super excited to see Precog Enthusiasts make it to the broadcast this week. They faltered in lower bracket round six, so basically just one serious win away from the weekend last weekend. So this time around, they're on the on the docket, basically, and they're up against Punch Squad, which I think is going to be one of the scarier teams running uh, the good old Arms Warrior, Red Paladin, Fist Weaver comp, and... I've spoken to some of the players, some of the teams, and they are a little bit nervous about Punch Squad and that comp that they have to go up against. And of course, well, you have Twinkle on that team as well, who is a pretty, uh, I want to say, well-versed Druid player who can come in and maybe turn the tides if something goes wrong. Absolutely. He, he is up against some big names here, though. Um, but, I, you know, I think that's kind of one of the things that I do really like, Seiko, and appreciate about these new teams coming in, especially when we look at last week, Lava Lava, um, you know, Hula mm -hmm. Bang. It really tends to shake things up with the meta, challenge teams like Echo. Absolutely. And, and, and that's the thing, right? Um, we saw it for the very first time, uh, kind of in a long, long, uh, since Shadowlands, I want to say, or maybe even before then. Um, where Echo actually got completely dismantled. They were not in the grand finals, uh, and they had kind of a slow... I mean, they still finished top three, but, you know, uh, had a bit of a slower... Slow for um, Echo. <laughs> yeah, by, by their own standards, of course. Um, so for, for, uh, for Europe, it, it has been a, a kind of a new thing. We have teams like Hulibang. We have teams like Lava Lava. We have uh, newly formed rosters who are actually taking on, uh, you know, this dynasty that we've had uh, in Echo. And we're starting to see kind of some of the players as well are scattering around. Some new teams are forming uh, with well-known names, uh, both in EU and NA. So uh, I, f I feel like the competition has only uh, gotten uh, more and more fierce uh, and especially with this year's uh, format where you only have two cups 
to get your points. Like we're talking about Swapsy, we're talking about the the wandering water for folks. Swapsy, he's won I think more BlizzCons than any, than anyone, and there is actually a chance, depending on how the bracket goes this weekend, that he doesn't make Gauntlet. Not he doesn't make top three. He doesn't make gauntlet. So it really is anybody's game here in Europe. And uh, there is a, there's a definitely a lot to play for today. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. A, a lot of big names are not really where we would normally expect them to be. Uh, that second series of the day also. I'm really looking forward to that one. Then if we looked at it, it's Hula Bang, you know, that team that did incredibly well last weekend, of course, versus Pirate Pete. They're a new roster, uh, but not actually a new... Uh, you know, new players. A lot of them uh, we do know. We've seen them quite around a while. Excuse me, in AWC. Gelu, Nixie, Clyde, Corky. So some really well-known names here in AWC. Yeah, they had a Warlock on their team last week, um, but they're going to be bringing in Corky, who is well-known for playing that balance druid. And that brings in a bunch of different compositions for them. Obviously, Nixie is one of those players. We know him for being a rogue, but uh, kind of an overall melee specialist. So they're going to have the mage uh, with Gelu, and Gelu also plays Warlock. So they could actually bring in some wizard compositions, which is something I had a lot of questions about last week, um, I was particularly into Hula Bang. Like, can you run these wizard comps with the Demonology Warlock, which is normally kind of like a soft counter for the Subtlety Rogue. So uh, I think if we do see it, it's going to be from Pirate Pete's here in um, the second series of the day. Yeah, sounds like a really well-rounded team. So maybe they will be able to take on Hulabang because we know how well they did perform. That's going to be the second series of the day. They're in the lower bracket as well, so potential to get knocked out there. But let's go back to this series of Precog Enthusiasts versus Punch Squad. The players are ready to go. Game number one, this is best of five, and also an elimination round as well, Zico. Absolutely is. And uh, for both of these teams, you want to get as many points as possible because neither one of these squads are uh, guaranteed a spot in the gauntlet. So uh, these guys are fighting for gauntlet. They're fighting for as many points as possible. Uh, and there is definitely some other teams here uh, who are uh, cheering for the downfall of both of these teams. And I'm, again, thinking about the Swapsy and the, the Wandering Water Furbogs. Um, there's, you know, those teams that are kind of on the uh, edge of uh, of making it or not to that gauntlet, uh, those are definitely those guys are definitely going to be glued to their monitors here to see uh, who comes out ahead and how deep of a run they have. But um, what, what what are you expecting here, Lithy? Is there a specific comp that that you would like to see here, or um, uh, what's your uh, initial thoughts here on the matchup? Um, it's it's going to be an interesting one. I mean, Punch Squad running this really. I kind of want to almost want to call it nasty melee cleave and uh, running into that on the other side last weekend precog enthusiasts not quite making the main broadcast but you have some big names on that roster right Luxia mm -hmm. running that uh, resto druid you got Jamie an incredible if not one of the best elemental shamans in Europe and of course MVQ on the demon hunter and if you play demon hunter you've probably heard of him and heading into <laughs> Grand Arena, this is going to be a tough one. you got to watch out for all the saves and stops that Punch Squad has available for the goals of Precock Enthusiasts. But overall, it's going to be tight. I have no idea who's going to win this, Zico. Yeah, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Precog Enthusiasts versus Punch Squad, game number one. The gates are open, and we finally get to see uh, what they decide to roll with here. So Precog Enthusiasts going to be going with that uh, Demon Hunter, Ellie. And uh, looks here on that Restorer. So triple mains. And this is a very popular comp that we saw a lot last weekend in Europe. And then on the other side, of course, we are going to see the Fist Weaver, uh, Mist Weaver, and uh, the Red Warrior. And already a big setup here onto Luxia. But it looks like Luxia is able to just walk out of that one and not really trade out anything. He didn't even trade out his Bark Skin. And instead, it's going to be the Red Pilot in here taking a little bit of damage. But big heals are coming in here from Nesty. Nesty uh, actually was crowd control there for just a split second, but managed to get back on his target, get that Fist Weaving out nice low cyclone here by luxia and uh, we'll see if they can capitalize maybe out of that they get a bash uh, onto the red paladin nesty still uh, trying to hunt down his target here a big leg sweep set up onto luxia but still actually not using anything there and instead it is going to be nesty using his life cocoon 
Yeah, Depth Harm comes out as well. It's not quite the Death Ball comp you're used to from Punch Squad running someone down. A little bit more split pressure going on here, both on MVQ and Jamie. And overall, the Elemental Shaman, of course, is going to be happy to be able to just Farika spam those meatballs and throw it at people's head. The wall coming in from Kylian once again. And for the moment, a beautiful totem from Jamie is going to take care of some of the pressure. But you can see they want to go back in. Punch Squad want to do exactly that. The swap on Luxia once again coming in, but he is just holding on to Barkskin. The man is chilling. Kylian dropping Ooh. down to 20%, though. That's a solid, solid burst of damage, forcing the bubble out. But for the moment, Punch Squad going to stay alive and probably going to keep rolling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Punch Squad is going to trade out that cooldown. And also, they don't have the lay on hands here on, on Killian. Full hex secured onto Nesty. Nesty for, forced to trade out his trinket there. Killian still not out of the woods yet. Forced to trade out his trinket. Now, finally, they get on top of Luxia. There's the Barkskin. There's the Leg Sweep. I don't know if that's going to be enough. Luxia actually uh, respects the situation here. He overlaps his trinket with the Barkskin. Uh, uses that trinket tranquility, which is uh, essentially a bubble for Druids uh, in Dragonflight. DR Cyclone coming out here onto Nesty. And uh, Killian dropping dangerously low once again. The Life Cocoon, though, sneaks in in the nick of time. Looks at looking for a Cyclone here onto the Red Paladin, but the Red Paladin realizes the situation, ranges it, and Tay hey. might just go down right now. Tay dropping dangerously low. Nice uh, banish there, nice imprisonment onto Tay, but uh, still, Luxia is going to be taking a lot of damage here. He needs to try to pre Iron Bark um, this next setup onto himself because he has no out. So if this melee cleave connects onto Luxia, it could be in massive trouble. He's going to need to really time that pre Iron Bark, otherwise, he will potentially go down. There's the uh, Paralyzed. They're looking for the Leg Sweep. He gets knocked. Still not going for the Iron Bark just yet. Instead, they're actually turning the pressure around onto the Red Paladin. Luxia just buying his team time here in bear form. Jamie uh, really unleashing the damage here. And these hexes from Jamie have been on point so far, uh, really forcing um, the punch squad to play defensively. Yeah, if you are unable to kind of take this Mistweaver out of the equation for a moment, you don't really have an effective goal. The uh, spell warding coming in from Kalilian here as well, Tay staying a little bit safer for uh, just another moment, but they are uh, running a little bit low on cooldowns. You have a Trinket intervene for the Warrior, but uh, Sang for Kalilian is the only thing left, and at 20% sitting in the darkness, it's not looking good for the Red Paladin, trying to get away, trying to kite away. The wings are up once again, uh, finds a nice interrupt here, but nothing more than that. Jamie in the meantime popping in that Fire Elemental and is looking to just hammer the advantage home at least for another second. Nesty on the case once again has the cocoon available but no trinket so they gotta start to be really really careful as they are running low on defensives. Kylian down to 20%. The lasso is great. Another lay on hands that's back off cooldown after the start of the game coming in keeping them safe for the moment. Precook Enthusiast looking good here Zico but Luxia's mana is a little bit close to being empty. Yeah, it's not doing too hot there uh, in Luxia's uh, department, but ST also could uh, use a bit of a drink here, potentially. It's going to come down to the wire here. Killian dropping quite low here. Still low Cyclone coming in here from Luxia. Can they chain it, though? They get a leg sweep, actually, onto Luxia. They're trying to turn the pressure around here. Punch Squad looking for the one-hit wonder here onto Luxia. Luxia denying for now, though. Still has uh, Bark Skin and Iron Bark goes in to that Incarnation, and he's going to be in that Tree of Life, spamming out free heals essentially um, but it's not looking too good like you said in mana they really need to try to close this one out right now MVQ and Jamie getting very aggressive bubble is going to be available here for Killian in about 20 more seconds here if they can just hold on for a little bit longer I think punch squad actually might be able to try to take this one but uh, it's going to be very very close here it's going to be up to Jamie Jamie is that free casting wizard right now he needs to try to land these hexes and try to find a moment for Luxia to drink they're looking for it right now Luxia behind the pillar trying to drink Killian dropping quite low once again eight seconds left on that bubble can he get it Five seconds left, three seconds left. Killian's dropping so low, and finally he does have it off cooldown. Has to press it immediately as it comes back off cooldown right there. Jamie now getting cleaved, and that is going to be Burrow coming out here for Jamie. Jamie with nothing left. Looks just stuck in a hammer of justice. Can he keep him alive here? Looks just still in crowd control. Big heals coming out here onto Jamie. There's the lightning lasso as well, just to buy a few more seconds. They're swapping to MBQ. MBQ caught up in a DR leg sweep, but finally MBQ is going to be out of crowd control. And finally, it looks like pre cog enthusiasts have control of the situation there with a nice hex and a nice cyclone three versus one situation onto this rat who has basically nothing left looks he has no mana left jamie might just go down Ooh. right now he's got no burrow he's got nothing punch squad might be able to do a touch of death range and they will be able to close it out here jamie will fall punch squad taking game number one honestly did not expect that i expected precog enthusiasts uh to come out ahead here but punch squad really solid effort here uh, in game number one
incredibly clutch ring of peace there at the end from Nasty, making sure Jamie cannot get away from the death ball rolling him over, basically. And yeah, mana-wise, a very impressive performance from both teams, but ultimately Punch Squad just a little bit more consistent damage. Luxia not able to keep his team alive in the end, and when it comes down to these moments where you're running low on defensives and on mana, kind of the melee cleave just having this insanely consistent damage just beats out the uh, Ellie Shaman that's more or less revolving a lot around this primordial wave burst. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, also the uh, mortal strike effect uh, is just uh, can be a little bit, uh, you know, troublesome to deal with. The healing reduction from that plus dampening on top of that. So uh, here's just going to be doing a little bit uh, less if you are Luxia. And uh, I mean, in Luxia's defense, though, I mean, look at his man. You can see his screen right now. There's not a single button he could have pressed. Uh, really towards the end of that match and that, that's the downside of the rest of Druid, right? Like the upside is that you're very safe. It's very solid healing You're not gonna be too scared if a Druid uses his cooldowns on you. You're gonna live But the downside sadly is that you're gonna go out of mana unless you drink now for Druids It's it's great that they can sneak away and drink in stealth, but um, it looks like I wasn't able to find that, that drink and that's really what it came down to here I think in the end uh, they try to set up for the kills they had a lot of good pressure, good close calls onto Tay and Killian uh, mm. on the side of pre cog enthusiasts, but they weren't able to uh, uh, get that one drink, and I think that's what they needed. So uh, we'll see. Yeah. I, I think probably both teams are going to be running with the same comps uh, in the next match, but um, yeah, I, I think this is a series that could honestly go either way now that we've seen it play out. It's a it's a little bit what we talked about before the start of the game, right? The this comp of uh, Red Warrior and the Mistweaver. You have so many saves for different kind of situations, from Bob to Sang to Lay on Hands to a Bubble, and basically the entire div uh, complete list of ex externals and cooldowns and Warrior intervenes that you can throw in there, right? So overall, it's incredibly difficult to f get through that whole thing for precog enthusiasts without going super deep into man uh, dampening and playing around mana. Yeah, um, that's the thing, right? If, uh, if Nesty can keep his mana, because every time he's going to uh, start fist weaving, it's going to you know take a chunk of his mana. Uh, but if the game doesn't go on for too long, uh, he is going to be able to potentially uh, squeeze out an advantage there and we can see uh, at the combat log here as well powered by Warcraft logs the uh, damage breakdown here and it, uh, it really was just uh, at this point they kind of had that momentum had Luxia Um and were able to just uh, make sure that they continue that momentum so really yeah. good stuff yeah you can tell the, the last few heals just coming from the treants there's nothing left in the tank and I'm curious how the the next map we're going to Imperial Domain, obviously, is going to play into Precog Enthusiast's hands, because it's a larger map, and especially mm -hmm. as a Resto Druid, being able to get some roots in and maybe sneak away for a drink is a lot easier than Nagrand. Yeah, I mean, I think Nagrand is a pretty good map, too, for, for getting drinks, but um, mm -hmm. I don't think they were maybe playing to get those drinks uh, as much. Uh, Imperial Domain, though, either way, it's going to be a little bit easier to actually uh, get those drinks just have a lot of room to move around on and uh i think that for luxia if he gets um if he gets targeted a lot which probably is going to be the case as soon as those stuns have been committed and as soon as his team you know recovers from the uh, from the the go of punch squad and precog enthusiast starts getting their momentum that's when he really needs to sit down and try to get those drinks but we'll see what happens they yep. uh, again it was a close game uh they had some beautiful 3v1s good hexes from jamie and we'll see what they decide to do here. Already some crowd control being used here onto Nesty. And Nesty is going to waste no time. The feline stomp is coming in. And he's already uh, looking to do some damage here on that Fist Weaver. And they're getting onto their target. Luxia can't be too greedy here. He's going to trade out the Bark Skin. Trading out the uh, Incarnation as well. Swapping over to MBQ. MBQ Ooh. dropping quite low. He's going to glimpse there. And uh, with that, he should be completely fine. But a uh, pretty close call. And now this is the moment where Precog Enthusiasts are going to be looking to set up their pressure to get a full cycle on Tenesti. And here comes the damage. 
Yeah, Kylian dropping super low, almost getting killed off there, the Cocoon coming in the nick of time, in the meantime, Tay swapping back to Jamie, putting some pressure on the Ellie Shaman, but you can tell both comps really excel at doing a lot of damage in a short period of time. The big thing, of course, for Punch Squad is they can just tap target, kill someone in a blink of an eye, as we saw with MVQ at the start of the game, and that is going to keep on going. Luxia trying to get some distance, gets the Iron Bark out onto uh, onto MVQ here for the moment as Jamie once again throws in the fire element, looks for some damage, but overall is going to be pressured quite harshly by Killian and Tay at the moment. There's so much damage on this Ellie Shaman. He's trying to make something happen with the static field totem and gets away thanks to the uh, Chaos Nova, but overall that pressure is not going to stop Tay leaping in getting kicked out immediately of course something the Ellie shaman can do really well with uh, the thunderstorm the only shield and of course mvq getting murdered in the meantime nice double leg sweep that forces a trinket nether walk from the demon hunter and it really looks like preco preco through the they're struggling a little bit on momentum <laughs> And I'm struggling with words. <laughs> yeah, it's a tongue twister. Precog enthusiast. But they will force out the um, Divine Shield there from Killian. So another uh, pretty solid objective. And a lot more pressure onto Tay, actually. Tay still with 15 seconds left on the die. But so Tay might just go down here. Jamie getting some big meatballs there onto Tay. MVQ, though, needs to be careful. Doesn't have a trinket. Doesn't have the nether walk. They could take him down in a stun. Double Chaos Nova coming out here onto Killian. He's going to trinket out. There's the Hammer of Justice. Nice DR Lightning Lasso from Jamie. Trying to shut down this assault here uh, to save his demon hunter and a nice hex coming out here and now here comes the pressure on the killer if they can find a cyclone out of this hex they could potentially try to close it out but uh, it looks yeah too pressured right now to be going for any hero place like that instead they're going to swap over to tay they're taking a decent beating right now mana all tied up here um, between luxia and nesty and uh, looks now looking for the cyclones here can he find it he finds it on to the fist weaver here's the damage massive hits of damage coming out onto killian he's going to trade out the the, um, the lay on hands there actually so killian uh, using yet another massive cooldown so he still has the magic bop um oh, the ring playing, of peace. but they're swapping to looks a beautiful ring of peace there knocking him into the wall looks like forced to trade out his trinket still has the tranquility um and he might have to use it but he's trying to hold on to it he's trying to be greedy frenzied region coming out and that bark skin and that heart of the wild too uh, plenty of defense coming out here for Luxia, and he is going to be completely fine with that. But look at those low, low cyclones coming out. He gets a full imprisonment onto Nesty. Magic Bob coming out here for Killian. I think he's going to uh, stay alive with that, but uh, good uh, trading from both teams so far. Trading blows back and forth. Really good rotation of defensive CDEs here from Punch Squad. It's keeping them alive so far. And mana-wise, Luxia this time around actually having the upper hand a little bit as Kalyan goes MVQ. down to 30%. The wall traded out. Beautiful darkness coming in in the nick of time. Jamie getting cleaved down a little bit as well. So much damage on the entire Precog Enthusiast team. And Jamie dropping lower and lower. Shift and Burrow overlap. Massive CDs thrown out the window here for Precog and Punch Squad. They're just punching the pedal to the metal at the moment and they really want that second game they're moving closer to the gauntlet with every move so far this series and it's looking really damn good jamie trying to get some hexes in trying to get a little bit of cc in to uh, just relieve a little bit of pressure but tay and Killian, they got nothing to do with that they want to blast they want to chop someone up and it's really looking good for them at the moment primordial wave in two seconds beautiful lasso to set it up full clone this could be good zico there's the damage the wings are up but can oh. Kalian survive this 10 percent more damage going in the wall ready once again immediately presses that not a moment's notice too late and he's gonna survive for the moment as nasty is just fist weaving out of his uh, mind right now and keeping his team alive low clone and for the moment the pressure is going over on jamie yeah, and Killian still not out of the woods just yet. Nasty still having a little bit of work to do here. And look at Tay as well. Forced to trade out his cooldowns now. Nice imprisonment there with Tay on half HP. Swapping back onto Killian here. They might have done it here. Precog Enthusiasts are pushing him for the kill. Beautiful leg sweep to shut down. MVQ there. Nasty forced to trade out the trinket on the hex. If they can get one clone right now onto uh, the healer, Nasty, uh, it's game over. But uh, uh, Jamie could be in trouble. Killian still not feeling too hot right now. There's a bash onto Nasty. They're going for the hero play. Luxia. Yeah. 
Not able to find the Cyclone in time here. Not able to find it. There it is. Full Cyclone snuck in onto Nesty. Killian in massive trouble. Two seconds left. Oh, the Divine Shield. The Hunt connects. He has Divine Ooh. Shield. And he will use it again. He gets it back right at the very second when he needs it. Now swapping the pressure back onto Jamie. Jamie Please. has Astral Shift. Jamie is still in a lot of trouble. They're going through that Astral Shift like it's just nothing at this point. Jamie's still on 20% HP. Looks like with no mana left. Massive Nature Swift is coming out. Killian could also fall. Nesty with basically no mana left. Uh, uh, Shield Avengers coming out here for Killian. And he is trying to make his like final stand here in the series. Jamie with nothing left. Killian with nothing left. Who's going to fall? The Life Cocoon comes out for Nesty onto Killian. And that means that Precog Enthusiasts are going to have to stall. If not, Jamie might just fall right now. He's going to trinket out of the Shockwave. Still not out of the woods just yet. They're trying to turn it around to MVQ. They're swapping to Tay, actually. Tay still with no cooldowns left. Sharpen Blade coming out from Tay towards MVQ here. DR Stormbolt here onto Jamie. Jamie is completely dr right now. If MVQ survives, they could be able to take him down here. Tay dropping so low. MVQ as well. It could be a cross kill. Jamie's blasting. MVQ on their percent HP. He metamorphoses behind the Ta -da. pillar. And I think he might be able to stay alive with that lightning lasso. Beautiful Chaos Nova here onto Nesty. They're going to take him down. Precog Enthusiasts. They're going to tie it up. One to one apiece. But that was as close as it could possibly get. What a clutch moment there in the end. The meta coming of cooldown and MBQ just dipping out. Beautifully done, but once again this map came down to the wire and zero mana on either side. Absolutely insane and for the remainder of the series, Zico, this really makes me question what the map picks are going to have uh, in terms of impact to this series. But overall, an incredible performance from both teams. Absolutely. Uh, both teams played it about as well as you can, honestly. And uh, here we can see the, the last couple of moments here of the match from Luxia's point of view. And if you didn't know, guys, Luxia is streaming. Uh, his stream was just on, well, on this stream. Um, so you could see it there. But uh, yeah, Luxia uh, in that Hodge, trinketing out here. And you can see him just spamming out the heels. Look at MDQ here. He's so low. And he really wants to use anything to get to... Uh, um, to be able to heal MVQ in that situation, but he had no mana left. Luckily for Luxia, Innervate came back off cooldown there, gives him 10 seconds of free healing, and uh, during those 10 seconds, he was able to bring MVQ back from 5% HP. So, I mean, if, if that doesn't show you uh, how close of a, of a game that was, um, then I don't know what will. But uh, you were talking about the maps uh, and kind of like bigger picture, and I kind of agree uh i think we're gonna be going to small maps and the fact that punch squad made uh this map this competitive and they won a nagrand i feel like this is yep. this this is punch squads uh, kind of serious to lose i feel like they're gonna win on small maps and they have a chance of winning on the large maps now precog enthusiasts they're gonna have to win on a small map um if they want to take control of the series yeah, it's going to be interesting because if I'm thinking about the maps we have left in the pool in terms of size, right, of course, Toveron Arena comes to mind. But outside of that, what really is left over that you could run that has a lot of space to move and kite away from this kind of rolling, spinning death ball? I mean, you could go to Ashermain to an extent, but mm -hmm. even that I don't think would work out too well. And quite honestly, I'm expecting the next one to be a hook point and we just get the meat grinder. Yeah. I, I would be very shocked if uh, we're not going to hook point. And there it is. Oh, yeah. So hook point, the meat grinder. And I mean, hook point is just a fantastic map. If you're a melee cleave, short distance mm -hmm. to run to your target. And also, uh, if you're against druids who like to drink, well, there's not going to be any drinking uh, on hook point. There is water on hook point, you know, but uh, uh, this is uh, salt water. Cannot be drank. You cannot drink it if your name is Luxia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see if if they can uh, kind of overcome that. But for precog enthusiasts, it is going to be an uphill battle. I, I think that for them, uh, the nice thing on uh, hook point is that they have a demon hunter who can cleave. Uh, so that's like at least sometimes punch squad is going to be all stacked up, and you can get like a, a double or triple chaos nova and uh, get you know yeah. big AOE damage out, and maybe get some target swapping that way. But uh, it's going to be a tough one here for Precog Enthusiast. It's absolutely going to be a tough one. And it's 
it's also a little bit of a desperate position, right? Because if we look at the grander picture in terms of this weekend and Precock enthusiasts' position on the standings, they didn't make top eight last weekend. They're sitting at roughly yep. 12 points coming out of the first cup, and we only have two cups going into the mid-season clash and, of course, the gauntlet, which is kind of the goal for both of these teams. So you just cannot lo lose this series because you're going to be out of the tournament, you're not going to grab any more points, and you're also ruining your chances at taking Swapsy out of the gauntlet. Hey, <laughs> wouldn't that be something? But for now, we get to hag head into hook point. We're reeling it in, Zico. Second map, or rather, second point for one of these teams going to be decided here. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's get it. Uh, this is what we like to call the swing match. So uh, if Precog enthusiasts can win this, it's going to be the hardest game of the series probably for them. But if they can win this, uh, then uh, moving forward in the series, it, things are going to look good for them. If Punch Squad can win this one, then they're going to hold on to their lead. But right now, Killian needs to hold on for dear life here because he is still not out of the woods just yet. There's the Hodge. Here comes Luxia. Big damage there onto Luxia. And uh, that um, the reverse magic actually coming out there for MVQ. So they use Hammer of Justice onto Luxia. They reverse magic it. They don't overlap any bark skin or iron barks or anything like that. Um, so Luxia still has all of his cooldowns and they're playing around that one minute cooldown that MVQ has available. So, uh, so far, solid defense. A bit of a mistake there from Punch Squad uh, to actually initiate with the Hammer of Justice because if you use Leg Sweep, Leg Sweep is not a magical debuff. Um, so uh, you can actually not reverse magic that one. But Luxia right now sitting in a Hammer of Justice, Tay taking a little bit of damage. We got a Hex onto Nasty. Nasty sitting through a Lightning Lasso there as well. Into a full Cyclone there on the Sanctuary, actually. Really good timing there by Luxia, casting that Cyclone early. And they do get a stun here onto Killian as well. Jamie trying to uh, lob out some pressure, but uh, so far everybody is looking healthy on both sides here. And so far it is anybody's game. Both teams just looking for an opening. Yeah, I'm admiring the average Red Pally experience. Uh, you you pop in shield and wall, the first global of the game. In the meantime, your warrior gets absolutely murdered. Tay down to 30, goes into <laughs> death stands, a little bit of damage reduction and shaking in his boots in the meantime. They caught up to Luxia though, and that's some good damage on the Druid. Something I would love to see a little bit more of this game, that they couldn't manage quite as much in, uh, in Empyrean Domain, that they go and swap onto this Druid, which is just really good to do into interested druids generally you want to get off of the fully hotter targets and onto the warrior punch squad in a lot of trouble and quite honestly the focus on tay going up this game seems to make a massive impact so far for precog enthusiasts because this warrior dude he's just dipping around the corner sitting in death stance and being scared the entire game out he goes once again as killian is dropping down to 20 percent nasty feared up for the moment there's a lay on hands for 50 percent hp barely coming in in time and of course the full on luxia is he looking for some damage is he looking for a swap it looks not too bad right now it's a tree pop for the druid and he should be okay holding on to that bark skin being very greedy but you can see zico the mana not looking great for the enthusiasts yeah, it's not looking great at all here. Um, uh, but so far, Killian actually not out of the woods just yet. He might just die Ooh. right now. Full Cyclone into an imprisonment. Killian on 10% HP. Magic Bop coming out here for Killian. And it looks like he's going to be able to stay alive with that Magic Bop. Nice Cyclones, nice offense. Nice Hex there from Jamie once again. Uh, starting off this chain. Nasty still 20 seconds away on his trinket. So uh, he could still potentially capitalize on that. On the side of Prequel Enthusiast. But Jamie also had to trade out basically half okay. his spellbook here. There's 10 seconds left on the trinket of Nasty. If they want to get something going, they need to CC him right now. Otherwise, Kilian will probably stay alive here. Ooh, Soothing Mist coming out here. Jamie cannot find the Hex in time here. He's sitting through a stun. He's going for the R-Mastery Hex now, but uh, Nesty has a trinket, and he is going to trinket. Actually, that Hex broke, and he trinketed after the Hex broke. Uh, but he was just spamming his trinket there because he knew that was coming. Gets the life cocoon. Kilian will stay alive. Kilian's trinket as well. So they got Nesty's trinket. They got Kilian's trinket. They got Lay on Hands. And they got Bubble. If they can stay alive on the side of Precog Enthusiasts, they have a very real opportunity to try to take down this Red Paladin. Can they do it, though, mm -hmm. is the question. They need to wait for that DR. Ooh, they overlap there, actually, with the stun into the Cyclone there. I don't think Kilian is going to be taking too much damage uh, in this exchange, sadly. Jamie going for a DR Hex, actually. They're trying to close it out. And just like that... <laughs> Cast a curse comes in. Uh, they had the DR hex as well, so they're able to close it out. Precog enthusiasts uh, looking very controlled here. MQ is smiling, and um, this was the hardest. 
Absolutely. This was the hardest game for them uh, of this year so far. And you, you mentioned it as well, Liffy, about the Warrior Swaps. How, um, how much do you think they actually impacted the outcome of this game? Because they were going a lot more on Tay uh, compared to the other games. Um, it definitely helped put more pressure overall on Punch Squad, I think. The big thing for me, though, was the fact that Precock Enthusiasts, maybe due to the fact that Tay was pushed way more into the defensive and unable to kind of put as many stops onto Precock Enthusiasts as last games, but the Enthusiasts got so much more CC onto Kylie and onto Nesty, those hexes, so those Cyclones over and over, and that is not something we've seen in the first two maps, and I think it's something that is super, super important on hook point here, winning that swing match and basically securing them a lot better standing in this series. I was super worried about this comp in general, that Punch Squad would just roll in and kind of give a beating to basically any team facing them and talk to some of the players. They were actually a bit scared of this lineup, but it really looks like the Enthusiasts have, well, they got their number. Yeah, it uh, looks like the Enthusiasts are starting to figure it out, but uh, absolutely the Punch Squad, uh, definitely not a team that you want to be running into in a dark alley, I was going to say, <laughs> at night when you're queuing arena on your laptop in a dark alley. This is not the, this is not the team you want to be queuing into. Um, but we are going to Ruins of Lordaeron, which uh, it's going to be a, a, a action-packed uh, map, but I wonder if Ruins actually is the best. I think if you go for Ruins, generally speaking, you want to send the healer. And I mean, that's what we have seen. They've been trying to go after Luxia, but so far, the, the, the setups onto Luxia, it feels like Precog enthusiasts have kind of uh, figured out a good way to deal with it. Uh, they always have MVQ there um, using his uh, reverse magic, trying to remove the Hammer of Justice. And if MVQ cannot back Luxia up, then Luxia will trade. But it's always MVQ first, then Luxia. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's good to see like the amount of trust as well, because you have a Wrath popping wings on you, you have a Warrior Blade storming, and you're in a Hodge. If your Demon Hunter is a little slow with the Dispel, well, you might just die. But we are going to see the Punch Squad Ooh. bringing in some new tricks here. So we have Twinkle, Feral Druid, and we have uh, Devastation of Ochre. So we have, that is, uh, we have a dragon that's a and a surprise. cat. Yeah. Um... I'm not sure what to think of this. I mean, the burst damage is going to be insane. Twinkle is going to be able to disrupt a lot with the stuns and the cyclones coming out of the Feral, but on the defensive side? I'm not sure. The Feral is generally a little bit more on the squishy side. I'm not sure how well that's going to work out here, Zico. Yeah, that's the problem with Feral Druids right now, man. They just... they just... they take a lot of beatings. The, it's it's yeah. it's rough out there. We haven't seen actually too many. I think we had one feral in top eight uh, last. Uh, yeah, well, that, um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, we, we had we had one in I'm top eight on in the Europe as well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was Cassidy. Cassidy, yes, it was Cassidy. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we had Cassidy in the top eight. Sadly, he did get absolutely destroyed. Um, and now we have another Feral Druid, so Punch Squad really going all out. So Feral Druids, they're going to be squishy. Uh, you know, it's going to be tough for him to survive. Same thing for, for Dev uh, Evoker, honestly. But mm. the upside is the fact that they can do some serious damage. They can do some serious damage. Feral plus Devastation Evoker, I mean... If you get a Feral with Incarn by himself, he can do a lot of damage, but you add in a, a Devastation of Ochre in that mix as well, and they start, you know, with their tips to scales, uh, Dragon Rage one-shots, uh, that's when you could really be surprised, right? So Precog Enthusiasts, they need to watch out for the triple deep breaths, they need to watch out for the, uh, the Devastation of Ochre's uh, heavy hit combo, and if they can stay alive from yeah. that, um, then I think the Precog Enthusiasts will have this series in the bag. Um, if not, we'll see uh, if Punch Squad can take us to game number five. It is match point. It is Ruins of Lordaeron. Precog Enthusiast versus Punch Squad. One of these teams will be going home. And this is Ruins of Lordaeron, uh, a cemetery. So it would be a fitting final resting place. 
I was about to say I'm kind of hearing super tease in the back of my <laughs> head somewhere, but uh, sorry, for the moment bad. we'll see what this uh, dragon really can do because Kalian so far had a, having looked pretty good on the red paladin, going to be very honest. And Jamie, I think first global basically throwing in the astro shift, trying to kite away, and now the lava bursts are coming out. Big defensives popped on both sides. The dragon rage is in already, and a beautiful hex just before the rake stun coming through, taking Kalian out of uh, the equation at least for just. A moment. Big eyes here, of course, on MVQ as well, because he is going to be the person putting massive, massive amount of pressure onto Twinkle, coming in basically off the bench, still cold, trying to turn this series around for his team, and a double leg sweep might be helping there. Jamie taking a whole bunch of damage, but Primordial Wave is ready. Once again, Luxia throwing in the Iron Buck, and for the moment, the Enthusiast looking to turn the pressure around here for a little bit. Cocoon used on Twinkle. He is still sitting on the Survival Instincts, the Iron, uh, sorry, Bark Skin coming off cooldown in just a moment. So overall, Zico, I think we gotta need a few more minutes and rotating through some cooldowns before someone is gonna die here. Uh, definitely could be the case right now, but uh, Luxia is a little bit on the run here, you know, a little bit of cat on cat violence, but uh, nothing too much uh, of it. Bash onto Nesty. Nice dodge there on the deep breath. They're going after Luxia. They wanted to kick the cycle on there. So Luxia actually uh, didn't finish the, the cast there. Uh, trying to fake cast that devastation evoker kick. Jamie looking for the hex. Not able to find it. They're going after Jamie now as well. On the side of the punch squad. And um, the punch squad is more like a paw squad actually. Or I guess dragons have like claws or something. Uh, but Jamie yeah. still uh, quite low, but he's kiting. He's still holding on to his astral shift, getting a little bit of damage onto the Feral Druid. The Feral Druid right now uh, definitely feeling the pressure. Double uh, Chaos Noble coming out. Lightning Lasso. Triple Fear coming out for MBQ. The Hunt coming in. <laughs> Big setup coming out there. And that will be Twinkle using his survival instincts there. A really solid uh, setup there between Jamie and MBQ. And um, it looks he actually able to uh, still hold on to a lot of his mana. Jamie uh, dropping quite low there, but uh, just the trust between Jamie and Luxia is fantastic to see here. No one is overlapping any cooldowns until Luxia is in crowd control. Now we might see Jamie use something here. Astral Shift immediately going to be used as soon as Luxia gets put into that crowd control. And now Luxia doesn't want to overuse, uh, so he's just going to trade out the bark skin, and uh, he's going to be completely fine with that. But that, that was a bit of preemptive darkness coming out there but did you get a full hex here onto Kirlian and all of a sudden Twinkle could be in trouble beautiful Cyclones coming out here onto Nesty as well Nesty is going to be forced to trade on his Trinket and like we couldn't swap it to Nesty Nesty is going to be able to stay alive there now Luxia oh, getting yeah. chopped up here as well and uh, so far Punch Squad you know they they have some openings Luxia has no Trinket no Bark Skin so uh, potentially they could try to take mm. him down and uh, there's no darkness as well so there is an opportunity potentially for um, uh, this uh, Punch Squad to punch Luxia uh, all the way to game five. Oh, Jamie taking some good damage here with the Eternity Surges coming out of the Disintegrate cast that is looking solid. But something that is not looking as solid as you would probably like to see it on the side of the Enthusiast is Luxia's mana, because that has been shrinking. Overall, I also feel like Punch Squad a lot more stable on the health bars. Against my expectations for the Feral Druid here, looking solid. But now Barkskin on cooldown for another 5 seconds. This might be an opportunity, this might be an opening. The time stop coming in just in a moment's notice. Kalian getting hexed up, a little bit of a scary situation here for Nesty. Trying to get some punches in, heal his team up, and you can see MVQ just wants to kite away. Popping a Netherwalk in there as well. And that's a uh, big immunity out at the window, at least for the moment. F and with uh, more damage on Jamie, it's really more looking for the uh, right openings onto the Enthusiast here for Punch Squad. Breath not quite hitting the Shaman. And Twinkle going down to 20%, MVQ still on his back, and there he goes! The Lava Bursts coming through, the damage is insane, and that is gonna be all she wrote. Precog Enthusiast take the series! Excellent stuff here, Precog Enthusiasts. This is a team, honestly, I was expecting to see them in the top eight last weekend. They weren't able to make it uh, just with how tough the competition has been in Europe, but this is a team that you cannot count out. This is a team with a lot of experience on the roster. 
um, and uh, they're gonna show it here. You know, we got Luxia. He's I think he uh, he's a top three uh, experience uh, BlizzCon Andy. Uh, I think same for Jamie, actually. I think both of them have a, a, a top three finish at BlizzCon. But what's even more impressive, actually, is the fact that MVQ, in his very first tournament, uh, which was in Classic WoW, I think in like 2020, he was actually in a team with me and Peyo and Venruki, and he won that tournament with us. So uh, MVQ um, looks uh, like he's gotten even better with the years here on that Demon Hunter. Yeah. Uh, definitely more impressive that he uh, uh, won that Warzone Gold tourney than uh, a BlizzCon. Um, but yeah, here uh, they're gonna pick up some points in this uh, uh, in this lower bracket here. Knock out the punch squad, and uh, they uh, didn't reveal too much of their hand. But I'm curious to see here, Nesty. Ah, the cocoon there at the end. I wondered. I wondered what happened with the cocoon there at the end, but uh, he couldn't uh, press it earlier. He was in crowd control because I saw that uh, when Twinkle died, there was a cocoon onto Nesty. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, it's just what happens. Like when you're spamming a button on someone and they die. Before it goes off, you just press it on yourself instead. Um, so yeah, not the biggest, uh, not, not really a sense. mistake there. I mean, that's, that's how it is. It's the same like when you play like a priest yeah. or, you know, you're spamming pains of pressure, like, come on, come on. And then you, uh, you just don't get it off in time. Uh, but yeah, cool for precog enthusiasts uh, uh, taking this serious. And this is, this is actually, I would say, the, probably the most popular comp. No, he could have life cocoon right there. There was a gap. He, was, he hesitated. He hesitated. Um, well, but yeah, Twinkle was still sitting on renewal and uh, was coming up in bark skin. It was a clutch moment, clutch moment. But hey, that's that's the AWC top eight, right? It's yeah. those moment, uh, moment secondary de decisions, and if you don't make the right one, hey, you're out of the tournament, and that's how quickly it goes. That's that's it. Blink and you miss it. And for the punch squad, I don't think they actually managed to gather enough points here to um, be making it into the gauntlet. I don't think they. Uh, they, they yeah. So the punch the punch squad going into that. Yeah. So the punch squad had twelve Wait. points here uh, heading into this. So the punch squad finished with fifty-two. I think, if my math is not completely awful. So, yeah, uh, for the Punch Squad, sadly, we won't see them in the gauntlet, um, but uh, opportunities here, opportunities here uh, for the, the enthusiasts to potentially uh, yoink that spot. Yeah, and that also means that the, uh, the Furbolgs will be continuing to shake as the lower bracket progresses, because it needs two mm -hmm. teams <laughs> to kick them out of the gauntlet contention, right, Aya? Yeah, I think something like that. Uh, we'll, of course, keep everyone updated as we go along because there's a lot of situations that can be happening now, as we've said so many times today, that, you know, this is the last cup for these players to get some points. So I'm sure the precog enthusiasts are going to be pretty stoked on that win just now. Uh, that was a lower bracket series, so they were facing elimination here. Starting off, like, the first day of a uh, first game of a day, though, Zico, I have to imagine if you're in the lower bracket that early on has to be... A uh, little tiresome. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> this is it's it, this is so unlike uh, the AWC in the past that, yeah. that they, this is just it. This is uh, you have two weeks. That's it. Get as many points as you po as you possibly can. And um, if we look at uh, at this uh, graph here, I'm trying to see here if there is a team maybe that's not on here that's still in the tournament, but. Uh, Precog Enthusiast right now in 7th place, WWF, which is Swapsy's team, 6th with 52 points. They will actually, uh, so they're sharing a tie right now for 7th. Precog Enthusiast, if they win the next game, they are going to be able to climb over uh, Wandering Water Furbox. Black is already above them, so um, Pirate Pete's potentially uh, could be uh, another team that could maybe uh, make a run here and, and pass Swapsy's team. And we could find ourselves in a situation where Swapsy doesn't make the gauntlet or where Swapsy is the, the, the team that has to play the most games in the gauntlet, where they, <laughs> everybody, like, like they the might bottom. be able to... Oh, man. Oh, this is, this is going to be so insane. <laughs> I can't wait to see <laughs> just how all of these teams place on this chart um, because uh, it's going to decide a lot in the future. 
No, I, I'm absolutely with you. I think EU is uh, definitely turning into a very spicy region just in terms of everything that's going on right now uh, with the standings. But here's a look at the bracket and where we are currently. Of course, that series that we did just see, first one of the day, Precog Enthusiasts versus Punch Squad. We're going to see them moving forward, Precog Enthusiasts, that is, into the lower bracket. Uh, we'll get a competitor for them by the end of today. They're going to be playing the loser of match number three. So that's either Lava Lava or Chibaku Tensei uh, Lithi. And that's, that's not going to be an easy one either, by any means. I am so excited for the follow-up of that series because Lava Lava versus Chibaku Tensei is going to be an absolute banger. For me, both teams, potential contestants for just actually winning the entire cup and qualifying for mm. the top three immediately. So Precog Enthusiast's road from here is only going to get harder and I'm all here for it. Yep, we're going to follow them along as they kind of carve their way through this lower bracket. So we're heading to another lower bracket game. It is Hula Bang versus Pirate Pete's. I am also super excited for this one. It's going to be a banger. So stick around. We're going to head to a break. We'll come up, we'll come up to that series in just a bit.
everybody welcome back we are the second series of the day it is yet another elimination round and then it is hula bang versus pirate pete's pirate pete's we haven't really they haven't been able to sort of prove what they're made of but hula bang of course is the team that won the entire series for the european region last weekend yeah, a bit of a surprise, I think, too many. Um, they're basically running one composition, the Windwalker Monk, Subtlety Rogue, Holy Priest. Um, they had a fantastic performance. It didn't seem like any team was really prepared for them. When we did sit down with JT, he, you know, one of the questions that I asked him was, is this one of those situations where teams just don't really have practice into you? Um, you run such a unique composition. You play it at, obviously, a really high level. Like, are you worried that when more people play into you, it's going to be more difficult? And he... Uh, he essentially said, yeah, like uh, teams are going to have their team as a target on their back. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll we'll have to wait and see if teams have come up with an answer uh, for what they're going to be running. Pirate Pete's is a really, really interesting roster. You have players like Gelu, Nixie, Clyde, Corky. They have all been around the European tournament scene for a really long time. Very high level players and them coming together. We'll see, uh, you know, if they can make something work. Uh, Gelu is an interesting one because not only do we know him for Mage, he also plays a lot of Warlock and a lot of Demonology Warlock. So I think bringing in Corky, playing the Demonology Warlock with the Balanced Druid could be something that they run um, into this melee cleave that Lubang is uh, playing. Yeah, I, I, there's a, a lot of situations that could happen here as we move into the blind pick for these teams. Uh, like I've mentioned as well, this is elimination round. Pirate Pete's very clearly needs these points a lot more than Hula Bang. Hula Bang pretty safe and comfy right now uh, in that number one spot. Well, I guess they're tied up in those standings. Uh, but Pirate Pete's, they're going to be really, really hungry for this one, Zico. I And I feel like also they're going to be drawing on all that veteran experience that Ven was mentioning that they have. So I feel like this is going to be, uh, despite the difference in standings currently between these two teams, just an incredible series. Absolutely. And I, I think you hit the nail on his head there. I, I mean, on one end, right, you, you, you look at Pirate Pete and say, yeah, this is super important for them. They need these points. They are currently down bad in the standings, and they need this so they can at least qualify for the gauntlet. But... Hoolibang, they're currently sitting in top three, and they are currently sitting in the worst position possible. If they lose right now to Pirate Pete, their top three spot all of a sudden might be up for grabs. Some of these other teams uh, might all of a sudden pass them, and then they might have to play a qualifier for their spot. So for Hoolibang, this is super important that they have a consistent good finish here, and uh, we're already going to see the opener come out here from Pirate Pete. And uh, we're already going to see a Cyclone coming out here onto Hot on Corky uh, going in here looking for the Cyclone. And I just got to say, you know, I always say this when I see Corky play, but it's, uh, it's amazing uh, that this man is still competing, still playing the Boomkin and still making it look good here. Always a joy to watch him, but right now he needs to be careful. Hoping quite low, trades out Heart of the Wild, trades out his Bark Skin there. And we already see um, the Angel form coming out here as well from both of these Priests so far. No one has really used any major uh, defensives yet, so it's still anybody's game here, man. This is awesome. We're seeing Clyde. He's playing an Orc Priest, something we don't see very often. Um, but we'll see Nixie right now getting swapped to. A really aggressive start here for the side of Hulabang, and they are known for that aggression. They have a lot of instant crowd control, and they can all kind of converge on one target. Right now, Corky's in a little bit of trouble. Clyde in a kidney shot, but will connect some heals. Looks like Corky's going to be able to stabilize, but no, the stunlock just coming in. Paralyze on Nixie. Hulabang is mixing it up with the smoke bomb. Can they take him down? Some clutch heals coming in from Clyde as he sneaks in and manages to find those in that smoke bomb. Big triple fear as well. Nicely done here by Pirate Pete as they look to strike back here on Eridos. Yeah, Eridos uh, did trade out his karma in that exchange, and uh, Nixie sitting through a disarm. I'm gonna see Corky looking for the Cyclone. Gets uh, actually kicked here by Halton, and uh, Corky just trying to build a little bit of distance between him and Halton. Uh, Fairy disarm came out there for Corky, but right now caught up in a leg sweep, but J JT is there adding in a little bit of extra damage as well, but Clyde, uh, trying to back him up there. There's a gouge onto JT. Can they find something? Nice chastise into a clone. Can he get it? Nice fade by JT. Avoiding that cyclone. Corky Fake casts the kick here from the Windwalker. And he's going to have that precog available right now. Needs to kite though. Eridos looking for the opening here. And they realize that, hey, we're in trouble here. We need to start kiting. Root Solar Beam coming out here for Corky. There's the Fist of Fury. JT forced to trade out his trinket, actually. Uh, what did he trinket there? Wait, what? He's a gnome. He can just escape artist it. 
Uh, I think he, maybe he got overlap with some kind of stun or something, or like maybe he got Cyclone and Root Beam and, and Trinketed that. I'm not sure, but uh, bottom line is JT doesn't have a Trinket. Eridas has no cooldowns. He's Cyclone on half HP. And JT actually going offensive here onto Clyde for a full fear. They're going after Nixie. Nixie could be in trouble. Halton Trinkets out offensively. Eridas with the Serenity. Big dam here onto Nixie who had no Trinket out. No way out of that stun lock, but Nixie will recover. Clyde manages to recover him in that situation, uh, trading out his Trinket. And uh, now it could still be Eridas here, actually, who could be in huge trouble on the next setup, Evan. Yeah, it definitely. He's going to preemptively trade out that Diffuse Magic at high health, wanting to basically get that damage reduction in his done, but to make a swap on Houghton right now. Both these teams are all over the map. A full kidney shot here on Clyde. JT's way ahead on mana, but it might not matter. Clyde just might outright die in this stunlock combo. Beautiful peels coming in here from Nixie. That kidney shot on Eridus is the only reason Clyde is still alive. They're making a swap on Corky. Clyde's now in a full blind. They're all over the map. Hulabang is really keeping Pirate Pete's guessing here. A full sap lands. Corky's on the run. He's in bear form, just trying to tank it out for the time being. Nixie finally connecting some stuns. Chastise on the cycle, and Corky just cannot get Cyclones out. In this game, Hulabang's doing a fantastic job of shutting him down. Now swap on Clyde once again. Are they going to be able to just take him down? This is crazy. Hulabang, just, it's just setup after setup after setup. And it's what makes this team such a nightmare to play against. Absolutely, and uh, it's it's so funny to see because uh, Hulibang, not a team that we've seen dominate. Uh, we'll table that discussion for a little bit later. JT actually uh, caught up in a full Cyclone here. Out of that Fear Eridos trading out his Touch of Karma. A lot of damage here potentially onto Corky. He's in a smoke bomb. Oh, he gets kidney shot in Reindeer form, but uh, it was just a DR kidney. Nice Solar Beam coming out there onto JT. Triple DR clone though, unfortunately. And unfortunately for um, uh, Pirate Pete's here, uh, Halton will stay alive. Clyde now is in a full fear quirky with a nice wild charge to get back in range of his healer and just build a little bit of distance between him and the melees right now Clyde still out of crowd control does have a little bit of mana left to work with they're really pushing for the win here can they do it is the question gouge into a full cyclone charge that keep coming out onto quirky and there it is Clyde gets the fear there's the kidney shot onto Eridos and that will be the trinket of JT coming out here no mana left for Mr. Clyde here I don't know how he's going to keep quirky alive they need to stay alive for more setups here if they want to actually be able to close this one out. Quirky's still very, very low here in bear form. Frenzy region coming out. He's got the power infusion. Big damage onto Nixie. Do they have a void shift? They don't have a void shift. Nixie could just fall right now. There's a cheap shot. There's a killing spree. Big damn onto Nixie. Finally, angel form coming out for Clyde. And that's going to allow him to free heal right now without actually expending any mana. Corky with a nice wild charge there. Trying to kite Eridas on that Windwalker Monk. Nixie's still very Nixie. low. There's the rule of him. Can they turn it around? There's the void shift coming out from Clyde in the nick of time. This is their last stand right now. JT though, dodging the CC chain with his own angel form and it, things are not looking good here for pirate pete's i think hooli bang are on their way to to take this game right now van rookie ah uh, corky's in a lot of trouble this is an incarnation looking for a cyclone finds it onto Eridos, but now jt's in trouble they're making a hero swap can they oh! take him down they proc the guardian jt needs to escape big heels gonna be landing that was a really close call a great push there by pirate pete's Let's see how Hula Bang is going to be able to respond. I don't think they're going to be able to train JT. A nice double fear there. Now a kidney shot on Corky. Corky could easily fall. Cloud gets caught into the chastise. Great Mine crowd gets. control. Corky's almost in touch of death range. But Peel's come in in the nick of time here from Nixie. Now he's in a leg sweep and they're swapping over to Nixie. Corky's still in a little trouble here looking for Cyclones. Finds it on Eridos. It's going to slow down that Windwalker Monk damage and keep Pirate Pete's in the game for now. Yeah, they get a Cyclone here onto Halton, but they need offense on the side of Pirate Pete's right now. They need to start plundering here, or this ship is going to be going down. Full Cyclone coming out onto Eridas. Corky caught in cat form behind the pillar. Slides in a full fear. Serenity is up. There's the chastise. There's no way Corky stays alive there. And Hooli Bang will take game number one there uh, with a nice CC chain with a nice uh, kind of uh, checkmate there at the end. Uh, having no trinkets and having your one shot, it's uh, it's pretty much the best way for Hooli Bang to close out the game. And uh, Hooli Bang, they start off the, the broadcast here with a dub, but this is the team that won last year. This is the team. They knocked out Echo. They knocked out Swapsy. They knocked out, um, you know, everybody, the Fiends. They knocked out so many of these teams that we've seen compete and do really well in AWC, and they came in out of nowhere. But this is... Um, this run has been very, very different this week. They barely made top eight. They're in the lower bracket. They already lost. They lost to the Fiends, and they went to three and two, actually, uh, I think against Swapsy's team. So they almost didn't make a top eight um, this week, but 
They barely, uh, you know, squeezed the buy, and now they are up one and zero. And this is kind of similar to what we saw last week, right? Um, we saw Huli Bank come in uh, through the lower bracket and have a uh, a bit of a dodgy, uh, you know, uh, run because they started on the back foot, but then they just kind of cleaned up. And uh, maybe, maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe uh, Huli Bank just is that kind of team that, uh, you know. When the pressure is on, they perform better. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see what happens in the rest of the series. But uh, Huli Bang, they're going to need to go as deep as possible. Because I think if they do have a deep run, I don't know exactly what um, what place they need to finish at. But uh, if, they have, if their run is good enough, they can guarantee themselves that they get a top three finish and actually make it um, to the midseason clash. So... Uh, their fate is in their own hands. I think even if they get top four, actually, it might even be enough for them to uh, uh, just be, like, guaranteed uh, qualification. So for Hulibang, they really need to get these wins. Yeah. I mean, they're no stranger to being in that lower bracket, though. It's kind of the exact same thing that happened to them last week. They had to make the dream run through the lower bracket. Um, we'll see if they can do it again. That first game was looking really good. Eridos on the Windwalker Monk just putting out devastating amounts of damage. Pirate Pete's? Here comes Gelu. They are going to be bringing in the Demonology Warlock. I'm curious to see Ooh. how this works out. I don't know if I like this composition, if I'm being completely honest. I feel like one of the main strengths of the Demonology Warlock is the fact that you're a caster with a lot of physical stuns, right? That's the main benefit is you have the Axe Toss um, from your Demons, from your Felguard, um, as well as you can summon another Felguard for another stun. So you, you kind of play a very unique role where you're a caster that has physical stuns. Uh, but I, I kind of fear that's going to be overlapped a lot with what Nixie has on that Outlaw Rogue. So I don't know if they're going to get full value. Um, I, I really am curious to see. I kind of feel like in this particular matchup, Geller's is just going to get ran at. And uh, it's going to be really <laughs> yeah. tough for him to live. I don't like the Demo Warlock. Like I feel like I would have liked Demo with another caster. With another caster? Or I would like to see Destro Rogue. Um yeah, I don't like I don't like I don't, I don't like demo. Like, how did they actually end the game on, on the set of Pirate Pete's? Like, because they were losing on mana and they were losing on setups. So, I, I, did you see the damage meters? Like, Eridos, <laughs> I, th I think Eridos <laughs> did like twenty one million damage, and the next highest was like thirteen. So, yeah, uh, doing a lot of damage on that Windwalker Monk. The, the Windwalker Monk struggles the most with connecting to certain targets, right? Like if you're trying to like chase down a mage, uh, it can be yeah. really difficult. But if you can actually hit targets, which is what Houghton is doing, like when they're constantly swapping around, uh, catching people in stuns, and Eridos basically has full uptime, the amount of damage Windwalker amongst Zoo is actually crazy. So I am a bit afraid for Pirate Pete's here. Yeah, uh, me and you both, they're really gonna need to... Uh, I think it's Pirate um, Transmog committed. I mean, it's it's okay. I've seen a better pirate transmog. You know who has the best pirate transmog of all time? Zorbrix. We 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 featured him on a Mog Monday. Uh, or sorry, was it? Yeah, it was called. Was it called? No, it was called Mog Sunday. I don't remember. But we featured him on the Mog section. Um, yeah, but I, either way, we, fe we featured him uh, because of his pirate mog, but uh, Pirate Pete's here, uh, definitely setting their sails into some murky waters here, trying to take on last week's winner in Huli Bang. And uh, game number two is live, Ashman's Fall, and we are seeing Gelu tagged in here on his Demo Warlock. Nixie already taking a beating for trade out his trinket, trade out his evasion there as well. Gets feared, actually, and they're going after Gelu. Look at Gelu, look at Eridos! He's one-tapping him! Smoke bomb coming in! Gelu dropping solo, there's the cheap he trinkets out in the nick of time. That was his health stone. That was his um, unending resolve. That was basically every single button that Gelu has available. That was his trinket, too. Um, so, Gelu, uh, gonna be an extremely spicy target here the next two or three minutes, man. Yeah, I'm uh, a little bit afraid. There's a full interrupt here on Clyde. They're initiating some setups. Eridos is all over him. Big whirling dragon punch. Well, he could get low, but at the same time, we have a gouge on JT. Eridos is taking a little bit of pressure. He's going to be trading out that touch of karma. They're just redirecting some of that incoming damage, but continuing the push. It is just go, go, go. Gelu's stuck behind the pillar. He could easily fall. Eridos is just going to trink it out aggressively, and I think this oh. could be the end of Gelu. Drops a gateway. Beautifully done there by Gelu. Dropping a new gateway. Getting out of there. Does not want any part of that fight. 
Cloud's able to keep him in the game for now. But that was a really good setup there by Hulabang. Let's see if Pirate Pete's can start getting some momentum for themselves. They have good pressure here on Eridos. Great setup here. Gouge on JT, kidney shot on Eridos, out of the coil. Mind control on Houghton. It's a three versus one setup, but they just don't have the damage to follow it up. Eridos is looking completely fine, and he is unafraid continuing the push here on the Gallo. Yeah, it looks like they actually proc JT's uh, Guardian somehow because it's a three minute cooldown. But look at Gallo right now. Clyde sitting through a sap. Gallo gets kicked on the fear. Can they continue the chain onto Clyde? It doesn't look like it. I actually would have liked to see Hawthorn do what he does there. Sometimes where he just goes like full babysitting mode, where he just like saps, saps, and uh, just tries to annoy the healer with CC. Uh, Eridos here with the Serenity. Who are they going to go after? They're going after Clyde. Big damn onto Clyde. Full kidney shot connects. Clyde with nothing left. Cheap shot coming out. Out of the kidney shot. One more cheap shot available. There's a gouge. Can they take Clyde down? And Clyde, there is the Orc Priest of Enruki uh, coming out for Clyde and actually allowing him to stay alive because of that. Eridos now on the back foot getting blasted here. There's a blind onto JT. JT, uh, I think it broke there from maybe a, a blade storm from, from that... Um, Felguard or something. Either way, JT is going to be able to keep Eridas alive. So far, decent back and forth, though. A decent amount of pressure from Pirate Pete's there uh, onto Eridas, but also these uh, Clyde goes are deadly. Oh. Clyde, uh, there's no way he lives this. He trinkets out into a cheap shot and a stun there onto Eridas. Eridas getting feared. Beautiful peels coming out here from Gelu. Clyde, once again, the power of the orcs right now at his side. Yeah, everyone's, uh, every subtlety rogue's favorite racial, the orc. <laughs> Just, uh... <laughs> Making their uh, opponents live in these stunlock combos. But uh, yeah, for Clyde, it's definitely been a blessing in this match. Eridos right now has the Touch of Karma available again, but he has taken quite a bit of burst damage here. Full fear on JT. He actually will have forsaken into another fear. But Eridos seems to be okay. Continuing with this push here on the Galu Mana. Still in favor of Hulabang. Eridos just continuing to make this push on Galu. It'd be really difficult to live against that Windwalker Monk. Fist of Fury coming in. Full stunlock here on Galu. We have a gouge on JT though, as it looks like Nixie wants to set up some counter aggression here, looking for a setup of his own. Big Tyrant's gonna be summoned. Gelu using that unending resolve to get aggressive himself and get some pressure here for Pirate Pete's. And it's gonna be Eridos who potentially has to run here. He's just continuing to push. He's probably gonna trade out that Karma and just keep maximizing his damage on Gelu. It is go, go, go. Trades out the Karma. He is unafraid once again, continuing to push. Portal's just a millimeter. Not the best spot for his transcendence, but it doesn't it look like they end up having the damage to take him down. JT not in crowd control should be able to keep him alive. Um, but both these teams doing a great job of uh, mixing up these setups here. Yeah, definitely. Really, really back and forth right now. Clyde, though, behind once again onto Mana. They're connecting onto Geller here. Eridos and Hawthorne. There's the kidney shot on Clyde. Eridos, though, they're making him walk the plank. Very, very sketchy situation there. Full kidney shot onto JT. Nix is trying to take him down. Oh, no, he gets paralyzed there uh, in the middle of his uh, stun lock right there onto JT. So really nicely done there uh, with that paralyze from Eridos. But now Hawthorne taking a lot of damage here from Nixie. How is Nixie doing so much damage there uh, on that rogue, actually? Uh, just uh, that killing spree really adding in a lot of burst there. Halton still sitting in stealth here, waiting for his health to recover. Eridos actually getting pressured quite a bit. Clyde looking for the mind control, not able to find it. Eridos, though, still dangerously low. JT's in a full fear. Eridos That's walking it. the plank, and that is it. He will be sinking. Pirate Pete. Uh, they, uh, they sail this ship all the way to the shore. We're one to one apiece right now, then. That's incredible. Uh, I mean, the, the biggest strengths from Pirate Pete's here were just their setup potential, right? Like, Nixie could mm -hmm. initiate crowd control with a gouge and a stun on JT, and if Gelu was able to follow it up with a fear, that's massive. And uh, Nixie set that up as well by getting double stuns on the DPS, so really, really nice to see. There was a few close calls, definitely. Clyde, like, during this moment, if he wasn't an orc, I think he was he was uh, not going to survive that setup. But uh, ultimately, Gelu, Nixie, and Clyde, they're able to hold on. Super back and forth game number two here. But I think Pirate Pete's, uh, this comp look a lot better than I thought. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I didn't think that this comp would actually have the kill pressure, but uh, they had good consistent damage. And yeah, just good control. I um, mean, you can see it here. Eridas getting spam feared. Uh, and uh, here they get a gouge onto JT Halton sitting in stealth. And uh, since Halton is in stealth and the healer is gouged, they go after Eridas. There's the J kidney shot onto Eridas, cheap shot onto Clyde. And look at Gelo here while JT is crossing the map. Uh, he manages to snipe him with that fear. And um, it's just not he no heals available during that time. And uh, as a result, Eridas will fall. And... Um, that's the thing, right? When when you have multiple comps as well, and you go up against a one-man roster, all you need to do is just find that one comp um, that can that can win, and then you just keep playing it. After that, you're not gonna face any other 
counters. So um, this is uh, really good for Pirate Pete's journey and also for the other top teams um, in the running, right? Because uh, there, there is a lot, um, you know, there's seeding and also, um, um, you know, the actual guaranteed qualification on the line. So if Huli Bang loses here, the other top teams are going to be happy about that. Uh, and Pirate Pete's, of course, are going to be very happy about the fact that they're beating one of the top dogs and uh, getting more and more points as well. But that's uh, looking a little bit ahead. Right now, we're in hook point and uh, one to one apiece. What do you think we're going to see here from Pirate Pete's, Van? You think they lock in the same thing or they try something yeah. else? What do you. Is this, a, this is a new feature, right? This damage contributed? Yep. That's yeah, cool. during the I kill, like it that. shows who, who, who like, made. Who, who did the most damn during the kill, basically? I, I think I that's awesome. That. You can see there during like the last seven seconds, it was actually Gelu on the Demonology Warlock bringing in a huge amount of damage to actually take down the Windwalker Monk. And yeah, it's looking good. I wouldn't be surprised if Pirate Pete's end up locking in the exact same composition. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the day, the Demonology Warlock is normally something I think is pretty good until the Subtlety Rogue uh, looks strong in this particular match. There's a few close calls, but if you can get that crowd control out, um, Demonology Warlocks are pretty durable, so... Able to, oh, yay. Make, uh, make it make sense. Please, make it make sense. I don't get it. I mean, the, the only thing I can say is it's got to be the map. Wait, the Hula Bang, the do map. they have a fourth member? Is that it? Did Hula Bang? Hula Bang, no. They, well, they were a three-man roster last week. I don't think that's changed. I think they brought <gasps> in... Uh, oh, they, yeah. do, they do have... They have Elswave uh, on their roster now. Yeah. But they have a Demon it. King. Mm -hmm. No, no. Maybe it's something actually... like Demon Hunter, Demon Hunter Windwalker would just obliterate Gelu, you know? <laughs> so they don't want to run that on the on the small map. Something yeah, like I, th that. I think that's, that, that's what it is. It has to be, but, right? Otherwise, it makes no sense. Yeah, they're, they're definitely scared of the fourth uh, member on the, on, the, on the roster. So that's pretty cool, though. Uh, I got to say, very, very cool. Holy bang. Uh, adding in another... Uh, and if you don't know Elswave, he's also... Uh, you know, been a super high-rated multi-classer in Europe for, well, I think it's in Shadowlands. So, yeah. He's been around. A uh, really, really strong pickup. Main, uh, from what I remember, Demon Hunter. I think he has Ellis Shaman as well. So, uh, it's going to give Huli Bang more options, right? Uh, and picking up uh, a fourth also before uh, the potential, uh, you know, before you potentially qualify uh, for the mid-season clash is just the perfect thing to do. So, uh, good for them. Pirate Pete's, though. We saw this matchup play out, and I want to say it was kind of one-sided, actually, in favor of Huli Bang. I feel like there was some moments where, you know, there was some pressure in favor of Pirate Pete's, but not like I was convinced, like, okay, they're going to win this game at any point. I, I never felt like, okay, this is their game to lose now. They, they're ahead or, you know, whatever. It was like a, they're behind on cooldowns, they're behind on mana. But uh, maybe they can turn it around. Um, the annoying thing for sure is that uh, Gnome, JT, just has a Gnome. Yeah. So anytime you go for that root solar beam, you just, yeah, just Gnome. The bane of balance roots. Root gnomes? solar beam. Yeah, yeah, root solar beam. <laughs> it's is the banes of everyone. <laughs> everyone hates yeah. Gnomes. <laughs> That's not true. I like Gnomes. Gnomes are awesome. But I just, if you're a, a Moonkin looking for get those root solar beams, instant crowd control on the healer. Uh, being able to break out of literally all of them is a, <laughs> it's a tough thing. So Orky's going to have to use that solar beam as basically an interrupt here. Let me ask you a question. Though. Do you like gnomes because it's annoying for the other people that you face that they lost to a gnome or because you like gnomes? I like gnomes. I think they look cool. I think they look <laughs> right. cool. I think they sound cool. I like their vibe. Yeah, I'm definitely... Uh, I'm a gnome enjoyer. Corky right now looking for a cyclone here. <laughs> Onto Houghton. JT, he's got a master spell. I mean... That is pretty bold. It does cost a decent amount of mana. There's only one second left of that Cyclone. He's just going to mass the spell off. Wants to continue the aggression, but a full kidney shot on JT. And this is an amazing combo. Solar Beam on top of the kidney shot. JT's forced to trinket. That is great. That's exactly what you want to see. I, I think if they can continue to mix it up on JT with the Solar Beam overlap with the kidney shot, then JT can't use any of his spells that mm -hmm. he normally can while in stuns. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way for them to actually go on JT and try to close it out like that. So I uh, definitely want to see more of that. But Nixie right now sitting through a stun lock. Smoke bomb was committed there, I believe, by Hotham. You're going to see Eridus right now sitting through a Cyclone with the Serenity active, but still a little bit left to go on it. There's a double fear. They're going after JT. Here's the damage. JT, are you ready to deflect it? No, he gets caught up in a Cyclone out of that kidney shot, but 
uh, was able to recover some of his health. But I really like this strategy here from Pirate Pete. Go on JT, then swap uh, back to the Rogue. And you're going to have a lot of pressure that way. JT's always going to be tested. Clyde's in a full fear. Corky's in trouble. Corky's going to trink it out. Trade out Heart of the Wild. Trade out Barkskin. Frenzied Region. Everything uh, except Renewal. is Actually, he did trade out Renewal as well. So, yeah, Corky basically used his whole defensive spellbook right there. But... Um, still everything available here on Clyde, so Quirk is not going to be in too much trouble anytime soon. Uh, but I really want to see here what is that next setup going to look like. They're going after Eridos, but they don't have any follow-up. They do have a follow-up, actually. They got a uh, blind out of that gouge. Should they have a stun as well? They have a DR sap. I want to see a kidney shot or a bash to get a DR cyclone. And Eridos might just go down right now! Beautiful CC chain coming out from Pirate Pete's here. They got the home field advantage on hook point. Yar. <laughs> Not their map pick, but uh, they're definitely going to use it, utilize it to their advantage here. <laughs> All right, doing a fantastic job. Bringing in that composition that they actually lost with on the Grand Arena, but it looked a lot cleaner. They looked a lot more confident. And this is what we were talking about. When you're hula bang, you're bringing in a composition. is good, but it's is it gimmicky? Like, that's the question. Is hula bang's mm -hmm. composition with the subtlety rogue wind walk among, is it a gimmick that people are starting to figure out? Or is this something that they're going to be able to consistently pull off? Because this looked a lot better for Pirate Pete's. Like, I would say they were in the driver's seat for this match uh, for the majority of it. Absolutely. And I think that um, Pirate Pete's, it's just the in-game adaptations. Because you always talk about, oh, yeah, swap comp, swap the, uh, you know, gear, swap this and that. But uh, sometimes mid-game adaptations, just who you're going after, uh, can just decide the entire game. It can just change the outcome of the game completely. Um, you know, if you're going after the healer more like they did in this match, because that's what got them JT's trinket. That's what got them into this situation. You get a gouge into a blind. And then here I thought actually Nixon was just going to kidney shot because the sap is on DR. But instead he goes for a DR sap, gets back to his target to do as much damage as possible. And then they do get the killing spree here. Damp and harm uh, is only for spells. So killing spree just goes through that and just chops up Eridos. And uh, this is, uh, you know, eight seconds left on that trinket is because of that beam uh, swap that we saw earlier okay. in the match. So a really, really good adaptation there. Look at uh, Eridos' transcendence. It's right there. I think he actually kited his own portal. He might have been out of range of it. Otherwise, it wouldn't make much sense. Like, out of the stun lock, you should be mashing port, right? Yeah. But uh, he diffuses and rolls. And I don't know if it was because he was out of range uh, of it. But yeah. I feel like if he got, if he got that portal off, he would have actually survived. Well, he's, you can see his transcendence right now. It's uh, at the yeah. pillar right there uh, where Halton is or Clyde is. So, yeah, I mean, you know the range better. Are you in range right now? I feel like you are, but I can I feel like on. you are, right? Yeah, I think I, you are. I, th I think maybe it was just on CD because we don't track the transcendence CD, right? No, we do. Wait, we do? Oh, yeah. so it, it was off CD? Yeah, it was off CD. Huh. Well, maybe it was just a misplay. I don't know. It happens for sure. I mean, uh, but... Yeah, I feel like the Transcendence would, might have been able to keep him alive. And normally we see Eridos, you know, use that cooldown really well to actually create that space. But um, with the amount <laughs> of crowd con with the amount of crowd control we're seeing from Pirate Pete's, I feel like that's going to be like something you absolutely need to do. Um, Wait, what, I feel like ha what's up? Wasn't it last week where Eridos he came out of a stun lock and he spammed Transcendence and he ported and died behind the pillar, and we were like. Ah, uh, if he used if he used dampen magic, uh, or sorry, if he used diffuse magic, he would have lived. <laughs> and then this time around, he's spamming diffuse magic. You're like, ah, if he used transcendence, he would have lived. Yeah, I mean that's the difficult. That's I mean like it's the true, but uh, it's funny. Monk, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's uh, it's uh, it's it's hard, man, because you gotta you gotta you gotta read the situation correctly. You gotta you gotta you gotta trade the right cooldown. Uh, especially when you're playing these squishy classes, right? You have to always like, kind of be one step ahead of what's actually going to happen. If you try to react to it in the moment, it's it's really hard to uh, to do the right thing. Windwalker monks are actually like, one of the things about Windwalker monks is I feel like they're actually very durable now. Like all, all their defensive cooldowns were buffed so much that you can kind of just like infinitely rotate through them. If you, if you don't panic and you don't overlap a bunch of them, it seems like mm -hmm. you always have like a button that you can press. So Windwalker monks, I think, unless they die in a stun, uh, they're they're really difficult to take down. Like they're they're pretty tanky. I think that's one of the strengths of this composition is if JT Aridas and Houghton rotate defensively really well, they can live an exceptionally long time. And when you have this kind of comp that can one shot you, and they can also are very difficult to take down, they can consistently do those ones one shots. Um, that's what makes it really hard. But an immediate Serenity, Nixie's just gonna trink it out. This is the Zwen. This is the Serenity. This is the badge. 
Eridos committing basically everything to get that trinket from Nixie. Uh, let's see if they can actually get um, a little bit more. I mean, maybe they can do a smoke bomb go on Nixie and actually take him down. Yeah, and I just gotta say, I really like that Clyde is still playing that Orc Priest. He has been a, a target, and it has really, uh, you know, kept him alive. So, we're gonna see Corky right now in a stunlock, double PI coming out here for Clyde, and he's gonna actually not be able to heal. There, there's the Divine Hymn coming through nice on knock. the Smoke Bomb there. Uh, nice knock as well there to knock him out of that Smoke Bomb to try to deny the go. They're going after JT. There's the Kidney Shot. There's the Solar Beam. Here's the Killing Spree, and uh, this was, uh, you know, a really, really nice Ring of Peace right there onto JT. That's the setup that got JT's trinket last time around but this time around it is not going to force out any of those precious cooldowns jt uh much better position this time and eridas there uh to deflect as well hot getting swapped too though hot is going to be completely fine just trading out the skull of shadows double chief are coming out they're going after quirky quirky uh able to just uh, free cast uh, you know with um with Incarnation right now. Halton's still dropping very, very low. Quirky though as well, but he has the uh, Guardian there, so he's going to be completely fine, and it's going to be Eridas now, trading on Touch of Karma. I think they should go after Halton. Just kill him. Wait, JT, is JT DC'd right now? Pop everything on Halton. Go, 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 go. Fast, fast, fast. Chastise. Clyde is there. The Shadowy Duel comes out. I think Halton is finished here. Looks like JT was uh, DC'd there, and Pirate Pete's... I mean, these guys are pirates. They're going to plunder their way to that next series. They're gonna make it through the lower bracket. Definitely unfortunate there for Hulabang, but Pirate Pete's, they were looking good in the series. Bringing in Gelu on the Demonology Warlock. I think picking up the Balance Druid, Corky. I think Balance Druids are, are, are quite strong right now. There's not a lot of teams that are actually utilizing them. Like, obviously in North America, you have Sam I Am, mm -hmm. but I think Pirate Pete's bringing in Corky on the Balance Druid um, is gonna be a big addition to the roster. Absolutely, and just the sheer level of skill on this roster, because, you know, Pirate Pete's, we know they're not like a. You know, it's not like back in the day when they were super try-hard, you know, uh, practicing 18 hours a day. Now we, we like to... Pirate Pete's is essentially the casual dads who eventually became the casual granddads, you know? It's like they, they sign up, they're extremely uh, talented players individually, and they've had a lot of success as well, but um, they just uh, don't, uh, uh, you know, compete on that same... Like, they're not as try-hard as we've seen in the past, basically. Uh, from these guys but you know they always uh, uh, sign up and they always uh, have good runs and and that is because of the sheer level of individual skill on this roster so uh, this is just one of those like a dark horse rosters you know they could actually take down anybody like this is the kind of team that could just like randomly take down echo they could randomly take down you know a lot of these like really packed rosters just because they have so many big time players uh, so we'll see what Pirate Pete's can do here, but they do knock out Huli Bang, and Huli Bang will have, I believe, 140 points right now, uh, and that's what they finish with. So their spot in the top three is not guaranteed at all. Yeah, a little bit uh, sketchy for them at the moment. I, I'm a little bit worried for them. I'm excited for Pirate Pete's. I agree with everything you guys said there, but Huli Bang, I mean, they... Uh certainly struggled in this series that they um for sure are gonna be worried about their top spot but i mean yeah i'm excited about pirate piece as well and back to like you talking about how they're kind of just playing for fun they're not uh as competitive as they used to i feel like we've seen rosters in the past on awc that sign up just for fun and then they find a lot of success and then all of a sudden they're back to being super try hard so Maybe that's yeah. something that we see with Pirate Pete's as they continue uh, with their success. I remember a ABC, I think, uh, was one of those teams, for example. Um, I could be misremembering, but either way, Pirate Pete's are going to be happy with that performance. Um, Hula Bang, probably not so much. But I, were you were you expecting that, Ven, when we went into that series for Pirate Pete's to do that well? Um, well, I mean, Pirate Pete's is just one of those teams. I mean, even if they're not practicing the most, I feel like they are playing a decent amount, but... Um, they're just one of those rosters. It's just a lot of raw talent, right? Like, Nixie has been around competing for such a long time. Gel has been around. Clyde's been around. Corky's been around. These guys are no stranger to competition. So very high-level player, uh, players, when they come together, um, if they have a good day, I feel like they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with literally any of these teams. So um, not a big surprise. And I was a little bit surprised to see Corky and Gelu not really team up together. Seems like they really do favor mm. Nixie on that outlaw rogue, which does make sense. It's quite strong right now. Um, but the fact that they were actually able to come up with some compositions, not only just with the Demonology Warlock, but are actually start winning uh, with the Moonkin as well, uh, I, I think really speaks volumes. And I'm curious to see how, how deep of a run they can have this week. 
Yeah, certainly. And we can look at that run that is laid out in front of them now. The path is clear for these guys. Pirate Pete's, you can see them down there. Uh, their competitor for that next up match is TBD. At the moment, they're going to be playing the loser of match number four. So either Black or Echo um, for for that series. So we'll see how that goes. We'll catch up with them. That's the last series of the day. But up next, we are heading into that upper bracket. It's Lava Lava. And if anybody doesn't remember what exactly went down last week, Lava Lava is the team that bested Echo, something we haven't seen here in AWC for quite some time. So this is a tremendously talented team as well. New to the the AWC scene, but they are legends in their own right, Zico, on the ladder, as well as Chibaku Tensei. Yep, another uh, two big teams here. We saw them, I think they were both in the upper bracket as well uh, last week. Of course, Lava Lava finished second, and you mentioned it. They beat Echo uh, on Tolvir as Warrior, Demon Hunter, Resto Druid against Ro Arcane Mage, Outlaw, Resto Druid. So not something I was expecting, not something uh, Van was expecting because we were casting that game together. But uh, Lava Lava, they're here once again. They looked amazing last week, and I expect to see them uh, to continue to, to, to look strong here um, in this tournament. So we'll see what they can do. And then on the other side, of course, we got Shibaku Tensei, uh, which is Mercy's squad. Proto, Limps, and Fuston uh, picking up the... Sh uh, well, Fuston actually picking up just the healer in general. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what those guys can do as well. But um, most likely, I think, if Lava Lava can win, their chances of getting a top three finish this season are going to be immensely high because i think if they win wait no if they win now they are guaranteed top three and they are yeah they're, they're qualified if lava lava wins this they're guaranteed qualification for the uh, uh mid-season clash so for them this is a massive like if they can just get that done right now that'd be perfect because we just saw what happened to hoolibang you did, yeah. And, you know, it's easier said than done. Chewbacca Tensei, they're not going to give it up easily. So find out next what is going to happen to either of these two teams. We're head to a break. When we come back, Lava Lava versus Chewbacca Tensei.
Welcome back, everyone. We have sent two teams out of the tournament, but fear not, we are not eliminating anyone for this round. We are here in the upper bracket. It's a big one as well. It's Lava Lava, the team that beat Echo in last weekend's cup. And then Shibaku Tensei, another team that has been showing quite a lot of promise here in the European region. They're heading into this game with 60 points. So, uh, you know, they've got a lot of potential here. Then I feel like this whole series has a lot of potential to get very spicy. Oh, definitely. You have some very high profile players here. It's likely Lava Lava. Um, they're going to be playing more druid based compositions. We saw some really interesting comps like the Demon Hunter Warrior find some success. I think they also play Demon Hunter Elemental Shaman. Um, so I'm curious to see what they end up going with the blind pick. Chibaku Tensei, they play a lot more shaman based compositions. So having Fuston on that Resto Shaman, uh, Mercy on the Warlock, and then you have Croto and Limps kind of cleaving it up. Um, it's definitely going to make for a very interesting and I would say fast-paced matchup. Uh, I definitely don't want to blink in this one because I don't want to miss you know, the potential kill, but we'll, we'll see. Lava Lava, they were looking really, really good last week. If they could continue that domination, uh, it would be really good for this roster. Right, here we go. The gates are about to open. They're bringing in Limps on the Demon Hunter, Mercy on a Destruction Warlock, and Fuston on a Restoration Shaman. Now, I don't know if I'd want to be a Destruction Warlock with a Warrior and a Demon Hunter training me down like this, so Limps is trying to do his best to peel them away, but he's already imprisoned. Fuston trying to static field them, but they've broken that down and immediately reconnected with the Bladestorm from Carry G's as he goes for a full fear onto Fuston. Possibly a stun onto Limps with a swap. Now they're just using it for crowd control. Using a lot of Coffee's crowd control just on the Demon Hunter to slow down the pressure while they can Continue the train on the warlock yeah i think it's smart they use a lot of their crowd control defensively like for coffee and carries it's just a lot of consistent damage that they bring obviously some decent bursts of that demon hunter also but as long as they survive a lot of the burst attempts of the warlocks they should come uh you know come out ahead in those particular trades big setup here on coffee though the portals are spawned fears coming in dex and no crowd control though gonna be able to easily top them off burning through a decent amount of mana but i'm not sure this is one of those games that does come down to mana carry's getting low he's got the diamond of the sword might have to trade it out oh, good. blade storms the incoming coil beautifully done there by that warrior denying that setup by mercy yeah he's got send ward up as well so he can likely tank these chaos bolts pretty safely um, as he actually spell reflects it as well there. Uh, he's just staying on target, just trying to keep the Warlock on the back foot. Fuston staying maximum distance away from the crowd control possibilities of Coffee. And they're keeping their pressure on the Demon Hunter. They get an Imprison onto Dex. Is Coffee going to go down here? He drops his Darkness. He's going to have to stay inside of that. Actually just immediately ducks out of it and goes back onto Mercy to try and interrupt that fear. And they're just waiting for their crowd control. Are they going to continue to use it on Limps? They stun Fuston, but it looks like it was on DR. Now Coffee's going to get last. So they get Coffee's Trinket. A double fear comes out from Carry G's. Mercy's going to port back behind the pillar during it and try and avoid the damage. But he gets stunned up by Coffee. Here comes the hunt. Massive damage. Oh, here comes the coil, and it gets reflected. Carry G's is outplaying these mortal coils so well. And Mercy, it could cost him his life here in game number one. Fuston has to duck in with a Spirit Link Totem. The entire team Hellstones to boost their health, to redistribute it to the Warlock but every single mortal coil that gets denied is just way too much uptime for the warrior. And Mercy is in this position where I don't even know if this is recoverable. Fuston gets a nature swiftness. He gates across the map. Limps is making his way over. Static field pulls Coffee away, but Carriages is able to connect. Shockwave to hold him down. Coffee is back. Eye beam connects. And Mercy is far out of range of his port, I think, unless he's relayed it on this side. He's in a lot of trouble. He's trying to soul rip to reduce the damage. He got a precognition. Maybe a chance with a couple of Chaos Bolts, but Dex is there with the Iron Bark, and Mercy is just falling more and more behind. He has a hard choice here. Does he stay in the earth wall does he pour it away and out of it he's trying to kite back in range of it and he's got to get ready for this next essence break but coffee caught in a lasso and they punished the trinket from earlier and managed to clutch it out against all odds i can't believe they're able to do that the game looks so one-sided for lava lava all those coils like we talked about were being denied by the warrior they find a kill opportunity and they're managed to pull it off with the first point on the board in this series and I do think this is going to be one of those series that's very close. Like, I don't think this is going to be a blowout either way. Uh, so picking up that game num number one win on a Grand Arena is going to be big for this team. Oh, man. I, I feel like this could potentially open up the standings as well, given the fact that Hulabang just got knocked out. Um, if Chewbacca Tensei could somehow win the entire thing, and if Lava Lava gets knocked out earlier on, I feel like there could be some disruption there uh, as far as the top three. And this seems to be such a difficult matchup uh, for Mercy. This is with a precognition moment where he got a ton of Chaos Bolts out, 
kept his pressure going. And I can't believe he didn't wall throughout this entire point in the game where he was at 10%. He walls towards the end of it, and Coffee gets caught in the coil, dispelled into a lasso immediately by Fuston. And Carrie G's was in crowd control. He couldn't get anything to really stop it. Uh, and it seemed like Dex just didn't have enough healing for the damage in that moment. So I think this is really important because this now sets the pace for the series where the Warlock can pick you know Warlock-friendly maps that are bigger on the map pick. And I think this is the series that likely goes to a Game 5. Yeah, I, I, I'm really curious to see how uh, they pull it off. I, I do want to give a big shout out to Fuston. I feel like he's been a really big playmaker. And Fuston, um, you know, originally came in as like a Windwalker monk, I do believe. He played the Windwalker monk, some Demon Hunter. Uh, but bringing in the Restoration Shaman, I feel like having that kind of DPS mindset to figure out, you know, those good lightning lassos. Um, this is something we've seen him repeat over the last, you know, this cup as well as the last cup. And there's a big reason why his team has found success. So... Uh, I'm curious to see if Houston can continue those aggressive plays and definitely going to be something that I look at, uh, out for this upcoming match. Uh, we are going to be going to hook point. So that suggests to me that Lava Lava, they want to go with a cleave setup. So, you know, the Warrior Demon Hunter likely going to be what they pick. And I, I'm curious to see if G Baku Tensei is going to be confident with Mercy on the Warlock uh, on the small map of hook point. I mean, what what other option do they really have? I mean, other than possibly mirroring, but I feel like a melee cleave with a shaman is just inferior to a druid cleave in a head to head uh, like that. So I would be pretty surprised uh, if they do that. It's just they're hoping they can maybe get like a YOLO grip in, silence, stun, kill on the healer um, with the Death Knight Demon Hunter comp that they tried to use last week, but they kind of got obliterated with it. So maybe they just want to keep the warlock in and keep their hands warm. Uh, keep the strats clean, um, even though the map might be not as favored to them, um, as opposed to switching the, the entire play style of the team uh, game to game. They're taking their time, though, to really think about it um, and maybe what they're targeting. It seems like they focused the Demon Hunter a lot in that last game. I know that Carry G's on that Warrior likes to stack a lot of versatility. I, I can't remember if it, the exact number. I think it was like 50% versatility or something. Because um, typically Warriors are actually kind of like a primary target for a lot of teams. But because he's built his character so tanky a lot of teams are actually opting to attack other targets they are going to keep the same composition this is likely going to be their hardest map for chibaku tensai if they can win this map man they might just run away with the entire series they, they might force lava lava to go back to their demon hunter ellie um a lot of you know big things could happen the top three is almost wide open now with hula bang out of the competition so early on so they really need this if they want to have a chance to avoid the gauntlet <sighs> And nervous, but I, I do think Lava Lava, they look good in that first game. Uh, Chibaku Tensei obviously found that win condition. That's something that they can do, right? Like the Demon or the Destruction Warlock, Demon Hunter Restoration Shaman, you're going to have those big potentials to swap. So Lava Lava, it's going to be all about consistency for them. They need to make sure that nobody kind of falls over randomly, like we saw in that last game. And as long as they can stay alive and keep up that consistent damage and deny the setups from Mercy, that's going to be the ticket for a Lava Lava to actually win this series. So. Uh, I'm curious to see what they can do, um, but obviously this this matters a lot, right? Like these teams, they want to start picking up their points for Lava Lava. If they can win this series, I think Zika was saying it's basically a guarantee that they make it into the top three, which I think for a team we didn't really, I, I don't want to say that I didn't expect much from this team, but you know, um, there are some new faces to the AWC. So for them to come in, make it to the top three so quickly in these two cups, um, it's very impressive. Yeah, okay, they're not like a public facing team, right? They're their ladder players doing really good on the ladder, and this is their opportunity to really debut themselves kind of in the public domain. And with the performance they had last week, being one of the first teams to ever defeat Echo literally in years was impressive. Here they're a little bit on the back foot, but I wouldn't completely count them out, uh, especially if Carry G's keeps up these plays with the spell reflex and the blade storms on the coils. Every time that happens as a warlock, you're just infuriated because that's like your one moment to actually cast Chaos Bolt. And if it gets denied, then you just get no opportunities to do it. And it can be very difficult to, to get enough pressure to actually run the other team over. Uh, Limps had really good damage output in that last game to be able to kind of turn that around in the final moment. And I think Fuston, including those lassos and finding those and enabling him, using Limps' stuns on the healer, using Fuston's stuns onto the Demon Hunter and you know allocating their resources so that they can effectively cover the whole team was really important in terms of like calculating overall what is going to be required to be able to find the kill. So they seem to have a game plan for Lava Lava this week, but Hook Point is a really tough map. It's really small. It's hard to escape uh, as Mercy was able to in the first game. So he may even just flip a switch and maybe play more aggressively. I really like
like the soul rip pick from him on the warlock it's basically a bark skin you activate that and you pull the souls out of the enemy attackers they do less damage and they receive less healing and they have to go pick up their soul but a lot of players don't so it's just basically 25 percent damage reduction every minute he can activate he's using gateway right away a nice static field totem during the gateway so they can't immediately reconnect to the warlock i like them synergizing those spells together here comes a lasso on the demon hunter but they are not actually targeting the demon hunter just yet they're going to imprison dex it's tough to say who their target is at the moment. I think it's Carrie G's actually. He's going to die by the sword very early on here. They just want to play efficiently. This is kind of an output game where overall damage is a huge contributing factor to victory. Nice double coil. Mercy is able to find it with no deny. Into a double cap stun. Houston is getting really cheeky on that shaman uh, early on. Yeah, definitely. Mercy's going to be portaling away. That first setup doesn't really get too much. Carrie's trading out that die by the sword early. Definitely a good trade. Dex behind the pillar is throwing in regrowth, regrow, topping off his team. Houston with a bit of an aggressive position here, but Mercy's falling behind. Houston's going to have to pop the Ascendants to try to get some heals out right now. Big heals incoming, but a fear lands by Coffee. Coffee gets caught into a stun with the fear on deck. Good setup here by Chibaki Tensei, but Coffee does manage to stabilize. Still in the early stages of the game. The healer should be able to deal with this pressure, but this small map is going to make it really difficult for Dex to ever get any kind of drink. So oh, it's nice. a bit of a double-edged sword. Here it is. Mercy getting low at the same time. Carries is getting low. This is just such an aggressive matchup for both of these teams. Constant pressure here on the Mercy. And these setups on a coffee and carries are just absolutely devastating. So Mercy's got a precognition there. He got a double Shadow Fury and a double Coil, and he got both Trinkets from the Warrior and the Demon Hunter. So it's a big opening, but he needs to survive to take advantage of that opening, and he's actually forced to use his Unending Resolve, his most powerful defensive. It's a three-minute cooldown. He might not even see that again in the game. Maybe he just dies even as soon as it's subsided as he tries to gate across the map, and he is running Gateway Mastery as well. So it's a larger gate distance, and it's a shorter cooldown, but Demon Hunter and Warrior, they got a lot of mobility. He's going to Soul Rip and Soul Burn Port along with that Earth Grab Totem. I do like that Fusion is trying to coordinate with Mercy as as much as possible either static field or earth grab when he ports to deny them immediately reconnecting but even still they're getting it back pretty fast here comes a lasso into coil trying to connect here onto coffee and take him down but they don't even get his blur and mercy is in so much trouble fusing with no trinket link comes down but he's stunned and he can't get inside of it if they kill that spirit link totem it's going to be devastating fusing just can't get there they still haven't killed the link actually but lips could just fall over what is going on this damage from lava lava out of nowhere forcing the nether walk now back onto the warlock to drop the healing tide totem he's gonna have to hide that but mercy is just oh, taking mercy. a beating Massive damage incoming as Fuston managed to somehow get him back to full health, but I don't like his portal positioning. It's on the forward side of the pillar, so if he ports right now, they can just immediately reconnect to him. He needs to have that portal behind the pillar. I think he could just die in the next couple seconds because he's got nowhere to really escape. He's tanking damage in the earthen wall and still almost dying through it. Mercy is going to port, but look, he's right in their line of sight. They can almost reconnect right away. He actually walks into a full bash. Is he going to go down? Fuston times the healing surge with Ancestral Guidance and Precognition proc for Mercy, spamming out fears. They're trying to keep control of the situation but they stun the lasso they fear up the demon hunter they're desperate to try and kill the warrior but he blocks it with a fear they in cap decks he trinkets out he's got innervate but Karajis with no doubt by the sword and multiple rifts on him is actually taking quite a lot of damage in return. Mercy is going to port back on top of the druid and he actually finds a full fear. How does Mercy do it? He snipes the full fear. His carriage is going to go down. He gets the chaos bolt as well. Another fear onto Dex. Limps is there and somehow, some way, they're doing it. Oh, Karajis is almost it. dead. A purge comes through and Karajis will fall. And Shibaku Tensai take it on Lava Lava's map pick up 2 0. Yeah, this is looking good. Uh, this is. Uh, Resto Shaman uh, Warlock, Demon Hunter, provides a ton of consistent and burst damage. And if they can actually sneak a fear in, there's not a lot of protection for this poor Restoration Druid. Eventually, he is going to get caught into a fear. And when that happens, if we get some good purges from Fusin and they're able to remove the Life Blooms, uh, he just falls behind on healing quite a bit. Uh, Mercy, like you said, has a very aggressive portal position here. It's looking a little bit scary, but the one thing that's nice for Chibaku Tensei as well is it seems like they're going to have a mana lead in this game. So if it goes on long enough, they might end up just winning on mana, but it hasn't come down to that just yet. They find these nice setups. Mercy is going to be looking for fear here onto decks, and once that happens, there's just no no real help, right? There's nothing that's going to be able to break that. He does have his trinket right now, so I'm curious to see what he does trinket. Immediately snap trinket there on that two-second imprisonment. So if he does get feared... Um, this is when the game becomes an absolute nightmare. So Mercy portals in. He manages to land the fear there on decks. Coffee, unfortunately, not able to land the interrupt. And uh, that's basically going to be the end of the game. The fear on decks. Aries is there. Limps is there. And Mercy able to take him down. And that double Chaos Nova is just enough to seal the deal. So really, really close. The crowd control was almost done. But Dex didn't really have too much healing. He had the nature swiftness. Um, but yeah, a slight misplay there. I feel like Dex, maybe he could have tranked that. They had an interrupt for that fear. 
Uh, maybe they didn't realize how important that one fear was, but definitely really good by Mercy to find that opportunity and uh, pull off a game two win. Really impressive here. And now being down two points to win on big maps, I'm kind of thinking they might do a comp swap um, and bring back in their Elemental Shaman Demon Hunter here because on those larger maps, it might be difficult to win as the Cleave. Uh, but they're actually going to go to Runes of Lord on, keep the same matchup, likely focus up a little bit more around denying the crowd control. Um, if, if Mercy is able to find those fears, it's absolutely devastating. But they went to a map that could actually be pretty difficult to line of sight. Um, with not many pillars around. I guess they also don't really want Black for Cold because it can portal into the room, but I'm thinking maybe Dalaran might not have been uh, an awful pick for them either. I think Runes, if Mercy is able to find opportunities to fear, I think this map is definitely going to allow him to abuse it here. So this is a bit of a risky pick, in my opinion, for Lava Lava. Um, and this week, this tournament is really a test, right, for the, the previous week's uh, you know first and second place, Lava and Hulabang. Hulabang are out, and obviously it's unfortunate with the disconnect. But now here, Lava Lava is also being tested. Can they be consistent with their performances week to week? That's really going to be the question. It looks like we are. Are we going to Ruins of Lordaeron? So, yeah, game three, Ruins of Lordaeron here. Lava Lava, they're picking a small map, and there's not a lot of places for this Warlock to run and hide. Um, that being said, this map can sometimes backfire because as a Restoration Druid, you can also get caught in the open, right? Like, you can find yourselves in a situation where Mercy is going to be portaling in and finds a fear on you, and that's when it becomes really, really scary. I don't think Coffee's playing Reverse Magic either, so not going to have that tech to bring decks out of that crowd control and allow uh, you know him to continue to heal so it's a it's a very dicey game that lava lava is playing if decks can avoid crowd control and they can't find the setups then i think they can inevitably win the matchup but the slim margin for error limps charging forward trying to get some snares going in on the warrior and the demon hunter to prevent them from immediately getting on the warlock but they actually use an offensive fear on fuston they're getting really aggressive immediately mercy is going to port back to the front of the room and i love that static field with the port but coffee just metamorphosis is out of it carry just kills it charges over to fuston blade storms the thunderstorm and is immediately back on the warlock pummeling those immolates and trying to slow down his ramp and immediately limps drops darkness to answer this initial cooldown pressure but they just imprison him low health and deny his recovery and if they have crowd control for Fuston out of this. They can kill that Healing Tide Totem. They could be in a great spot, but Coffee's actually just in a root right now and can't connect to the Warlock at all. That root was insane from Fuston, removing that possible pressure point from that Imprison at low health. But here comes the Hunt, and they waited for the Earthen Wall Totem to be over before popping the Hunt. So Coffee sits on that cooldown. Now he's got his Essence Break coming up. This could force the Unending Resolve if he's able to connect with it, but he's caught in a stun at the moment as Limps is trying to intercept him. It's really up to Coffee right now to carry the team. He's got the, got the Essence Break available. He's in a fear. Mercy's taking such a huge amount of damage. Damage. Somehow Houston does it once again, getting him back to full health. Rifts are coming down. Oh, but he spell reflects the coil. Nice play from Carry G's, although he's taking a lot of damage in exchange. Static field pulling him away on the stun into an earth grab totem. They managed to get dispelled and reconnect onto the warlock. Yeah. And we'll see what they can do. Imprison here on the decks. The lightning lasso on coffee. He has to trinket. So feeling a little bit of the pressure here. Triple stun comes in. Coffee could still be in a little trouble. Heals are landing here as Dex is in that incarnation tree of life at the same time, though. Mercy is forced to use his unending resolve. A lot of incoming damage. Beautiful fear there by carries. Mercy, that's the Spiritling Totem as well. So that's going to be the unending resolve and the Spiritling Totem. That's a bit of a disaster defensively for Chibaki Tensei. Let's see if it is going to cost them the game or not. Still, it's not their map pick. It's not the end of the world if they lose here, but it would be very impressive if they do win. They poured away. Oh, with a precognition. Multiple Chaos Bolts incoming there. They storm bolt the Warlock, forcing Dark Pack. Here comes a Bladestorm. Bladestorm is the scary moment for an Arms Warrior right now. When that Bladestorm ends, they get about 30% more strength for a few seconds. So this coil right here is great. It's denying that strength boost, and Carriages actually fell off the side. So he's not able to really connect with a lot of globals during that strength buff. And Mercy should be able to reposition. Looks like he's popped his Battle Master. He's got Soul Rip available. Available, but he's just going to port back. He's likely playing Impish Instincts as well, so that reduced cooldown whenever he takes physical damage. He's trying to be as slippery as possible, but even still, they're st right on top of him. Is he going to plan to use his gateway here? Because he's playing on top of his port, so if he stays here for much longer without intending to use the gateway, he may come to regret it. Uh, as we see Coffee disengaging back, is he going to go for crowd control? It doesn't look like it. Eventual retreat. There's the imprison onto the healer. No trinket for 29. Stun under Mercy. He trinkets right away, and he's still playing on top of his gate. Here comes the Essence Break. That's going to be a massive swing of damage onto Mercy, and they get 
a double, a triple stun from Coffee into a full fear on defused in. Double quote comes out from Mercy. He's in Earthen Wall Totem. He's tanking damage and trying to trade back, but they still need to get through Die by the Sword. Maybe they can kill him with no trinket in this stun lock. They stun up Dex. Carry G's down at half. He's not going to be greedy. He trades out the Die by the Sword, and he actually wastes his fear here on the Shaman. It was on diminishing return. So now there's no cr cr uh, crowd control threat for fused in, which means there could be an opportunity for uh, Mercy here with no trinket on the Warrior. He's going to relay his gateway, still playing that gateway mastery and cutting a massive distance across the map. Carriages is trying to make his way over. He's going to charge Pummel the Lasso before immediately re reconnecting on the Warlock. And now Mercy needs to be careful. He has to reposition back in range of his port. He's out of range of his port right now. He's going to Soul Rip. That's going to reduce the damage incoming onto him, as well as the healing on the Warrior, and then port back on the Stormbolt. Nice port during the stun. But he's dragging them on top of Fuston, and that's actually getting him interrupted and getting him stunned. Limps is going to drop down Darkness, but they may die through it. They're both so low. There's no Spirit Link Totem. Fuston has to cast heals. A double coil comes through, and Fuston manages to get a couple more healing waves, but he still hasn't even brought Mercy back to full health at that point, despite the Darkness. Double, triple Shadow Rift down for Mercy. He needs this to get pressure right now. They stun Dex. Can they close out the game? Dex blocks the kill with Iron Park, topping him off, and now Mercy is very far on the back foot at half health. He's trying to port across the field with the stack field. Limps walks into a bash, possibly a clone if Dex can get in a good position here to avoid the interrupt, but he's not risking it. He's just going to root Limps instead. Fuston goes for a stun on Coffee. No trinket. Oh. Big swap on the Demon Hunter. It's match point. Chibaku are so close to the kill. Coffee eventually retreats away. Gets the damage reduction. Mercy fakes the kick. He's got precognition. He can free cast right now, but he's taking immense damage. A clone actually snuck through onto Fuston for a moment as they pop the hunt. Mercy gates away from the hunt immediately as it snaps onto him. Great positioning. Massive Chaos Bolts. He gets stunned there right before his precognition. Yeah, that would likely would have killed Carry G's, but now he's got to die by the sword up. Mercy's on the back foot. Oh my god, his on any resolve came off cooldown just when he needed needed it, but he's still dying anyway. Spearling Totem comes off cooldown. Somehow, someway, they're doing it. Dex has absolutely zero mana. They've got no trinket on coffee, no trinket on carry Jesus. They can get a full lasso on either of them. I think they're definitely a viable target. Are they going to survive to that moment, Ven? I don't know. Fuston has to bomb out some heals. Mercy portals away. Coffee's in so much trouble. Dex has nothing left in the tank. Oh no, Lava Lava. They might be sent here to the lower bracket. Coffee Coffee gets stopped into the stun and Limps is there. To drop them, beautifully done there by Chibaku. I, I think they played this matchup incredibly well, both defensively and offensively. You know, proving that they are one of the top teams. These are big name players, and that was a very dominant performance. Oh my God, they they came back and ready to play, and I feel like that's going to possibly open up. Uh, you know, the top three a bit here if Lava Lava don't have a good run on that lower side. And there's some pretty big dogs in that lower side. Like, you, you don't you don't really want to be be down there. So th this was very impressive. I mean, they won on both Runes of on and Hook Point. I really like Mercy's build. Um, I think this build is definitely one. I was actually just playing this build last night <laughs> on my solo shuffle push against all these melee DPS with the Gateway Mastery, Impish Instincts, and Soul Rip. It just gives you a lot more defensive utility. I think it's one of the main reasons he's able to win. And then the synergy with Fuston as well. Anytime he's portaling, they lay down the Static Field Totem to trap the melee. He lays down his Earth Grab Totem. And they're just playing a really coordinated game between the Shaman and Warlock. And, and you need that type of synergy in a matchup like this. He's also he's playing Traveling Storms as well. So he gets to knock them away. Like uh, Fuston can actually use his Thunderstorm on Mercy, and that's going to knock both carries uh, and coffee away. So just a lot of defensive utility that you can use um, between the Destruction Warlock and the Restoration Shaman. And against these cleave setups, if you do a good job with that defensively, it can be really difficult for them to take you down. This is a crazy series, man. So many ramifications for the rest of the tournament as a result of this. That they really leveled up from week one. Like I think this was the question for week two was, can the teams in power currently maintain their momentum, or is anybody going to like catch up to them and overtake them? And th this was a really impressive showing. You said it in the middle of the series, the fact that Fuston, you know, this is his alt. Like he's playing Shaman as an alt, typically a melee DPS main, um, and they're having this level of synergy uh, is looking very promising for them this week. Yeah, I'm excited to see what this team is capable of. Fully agree with you, Chibaku Tensei. Uh, incredible series from them. And this is going to look good for them moving forward. I'm, I'm interested to see also what you think, Super T, is like what this comp that they were running in this last game, how they could go against uh, some of these other rosters. I think as long as nobody has a subtlety rogue, I think a subtlety rogue could be really rough for them, but Hula Bang's out of the competition, so it's really just Echo, um, which is the next series, obviously, we're going to have to deal with. Um, I think mm -hmm. Echo right now is their biggest threat. Um, they'll likely run an outlaw rogue instead of a demon hunter. 
Um, but Shibaku Tensai, maybe they try some sort of Death Knight cleave as well. Uh, in North America, I think Sidu's been practicing a bit with Mez, uh, and Sidu's team has very similar comps to Chibaku Tensai, so that, that could be an option for them against Echo. Yeah, certainly could. Uh, speaking of that next series, we we do have Echo coming up, so we can kind of see how they're doing today, check in with those guys. Uh, but well done to Chibaku Tensei. Lava Lava, it's an elimination round, or not an elimination, woo, woo -hoo, elimination round. So Lava Lava will be continuing on. Uh, they'll be playing pre-cog enthusiast, second to last series of the day. Uh, we can see where the Europe standings are right now we can see hula bang right up there tied with lava lava that i just mentioned here in chibaku shibaku tensei they are tied right now with echo and if they're their biggest competition that is going to be interesting to follow along here with europe uh, this this region just gets more and more interesting the deeper we get into these series so up next we have an upper bracket series once again like i mentioned it is black versus echo this is going to be another uh pretty big one here you know black obviously need those points you can see in those standings right there, we can take a look at uh, the bracket. The winner of this one will be moving forward to play against Chibaku Tensei. So stick around. We're going to find out who will be dropping down to the lower bracket to play off against Pirate Pete's and who will be moving forward to the semifinals. Stick around. We'll head to a break and we'll be right back.
Hello, welcome back to our single viewer. If you are just now tuning in, we just saw the upper bracket series, Chibaku Tensei beating Lava Lava, sending them to the lower bracket. And now, Lithy, it is Black facing off against Echo. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit of an interesting one. I think we got to toss in the disclaimer that Black, sadly, uh, running this series without their healer. So this is going to be a little bit echo sided, but hey, maybe, maybe they can pull something off. Maybe, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, their healer did get disqualified, so they, from what we've heard, are gonna try and work around it. We'll see what they do here, but uh, it's definitely, it's definitely unfortunate that uh, they're in this situation and they have to play against Echo Sid. Yeah, I mean, you're fighting the the biggest, you know, the biggest team with the biggest history um, in Europe right now, and you got to do it without your healer, your main healer at least. Um, I don't know if they'll try something triple DPS or if one of them has one of them has probably played a healer <laughs> at some point. I would imagine um, with solo shuffle being out, you know, you would think at least one of them has maybe made a healer and maybe got a little bit high rated, um, and they could pull him in for for a shot here. But I don't know if it's going to work against Black. It, it, this like if last week was an upset, I don't. Don't know what to call this if black manages to pull this off <laughs> hey if houston can do it this well on the shaman i'm sure black can pull something out as well you know <laughs> can i get off topic really fast this is so funny to me that this twitch bug is happening and for some reason it's not happening to zaryu everyone is one viewer and then Zaryu has 900 viewers. So congratulations to Zaryu. Apparently, That's you're, why they're all wins. you're the go. most popular World of Warcraft stream. Yeah, all our viewers went over to watch Zaryu. But <laughs> enough of him. We're going to head into this game. It is Black versus Echo. Let's see what Black can do here. Definitely unfortunate circumstances. But Oh, uh, my God. Oh, my up. God. If there was a comp oh, that could do it. Damn. <laughs> if there was a comp this that could fantastic. do it. I love it. Oh no, it's triple rogue. It's a panda. It's a cool Tyrion, and it's He's a not even stealthing. And the RP He's... walk. Oh my god. Super. This is going to be intense, to say the very least. I mean, it's a shaman team. You could maybe one shot something. You just all in, cloak evasion, trinket immediately. All of you shadowy duel somebody and hope they don't know what's going on. Like. I don't know how often you play against triple subtlety rogue, but I mean, Black needed to try something, I guess. Uh, they're gonna just wait in stealth. Maybe they're gonna wait for the eyes and maybe pick up an eye and then stab Waz, and they're actually playing this very seriously. Uh, and Lone Tar's team, I mean, they gotta respect that. I mean, it's three sub rogues. Like, one sub rogue can kill you pretty fast. Three sub rogues is gonna kill you really fast. They get a sap on Channel. They're gonna open up on Lone Tar with a kidney shot, and Waz needs to get ready to peel them, but they've already shadowy dueled in Cloak of Shadows. How much damage are they really going to duel here? do here? Absolutely nothing. There's zero. What is going on? Are they? even all opening shoxy's just gonna die i think they're just leaving him to die i mean p makes still in the starting room like he's not even moving i don't know if shoxy's are they baiting them like he vanished they blind is that a bait they send like one guy in and one guy waits in the starting area i mean shoxy has no cooldowns if they pull off a carry it'd be a miracle shoxy's got next to nothing left he vanishes again he's got a bit of a shield up for that cheap shots coming through on lone tire but i mean kidney shot no trinket there should be no way and yeah, okay. It, the t one of the other rogues is still in stealth, so I thought they were going to take it seriously, but I don't I don't think they are here. It looks like in game number one. Damn. Well, close call. I mean, NPC is still up and running, you know? Maybe maybe can pull something off. I've just got to make sure Echo doesn't get the eyes, but overall... Well, I'm fortunate. 1-0 oh up. If we're getting back to the question of uh, can Echo do well this weekend, well, at least they're probably going into the top four, and, I mean, that's a decent start for the position they're in. Um, honestly, I just want to take that moment to talk a little bit more about Echo and their performance so far uh, this AWC season, because, obviously, with Meg getting replaced, right, he taking a break and Lontar coming in, we had a lot of questions how well Echo would be doing, and... Lanta's Charmin last week, I think, looked incredible. The Druid on the shaky side. Yeah, uh, I think he even had criticisms himself on, on Twitter about his Druid being not 100% uh, there. So if they can use utilize yeah. him on the Shaman, I think it's going to be you know a huge benefit to their team uh, as he is one of the best Shamans. This this could have been a tough game. I, I, you know, If they were taking it seriously and had games on Subtlety Rogue, I feel like as a Shaman, you don't have like a, a lot of guaranteed ways to survive this type of damage. But I don't, I don't think they're looking to take it super serious, at least from that game one with one of their Rogues just chilling in stealth. Or maybe they're not even 
even in voice or something. I don't even know what was going on, but it was very not coordinated. So uh, here, game number one, this is likely going to be a, a blowout, but maybe they can make it entertaining. Um, maybe they needed to make sure everything was set up. I mean, I don't know how long it, they've spent like setting up their characters for this because obviously not all of them are mm. our main rogue players. So, um, But it didn't look like P-Make was really, <laughs> really trying to go for anything as he was just kind of at the starting area at the start of the game. Um, Echo are going to be pretty happy about this, I think, considering the fact that um, Hula Bang are out of the competition. This is actually like a good chance for Echo to try and retake their number one position because this is a team that they just always want to end in number one. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's not just the uh, the midseason clash on the line or the gauntlet. This is uh, this is Echo still in top three contention, and get, uh, getting out of this series with a three and O uh, is just a fantastic spot to be. And locking in top three immediately is a massive step in terms of points. But hey, we know it's not quite over till it's over, right? So let's see what Black goes for. They pick Black, Rock, Hold, Echo, obviously, sticking to the same comp. Gentleman actually getting to play this week instead of sitting on the bench, so to say. And I'm curious, triple sub rogue, triple outlaw? Do we see maybe a triple healer? I don't what, think you're allowed what, to do what that. What is out there that you could bring in? Thankfully, you're not allowed to do triple because <laughs> who knows if they would do it um i mean i mean the giga damp comp you know gotta gotta pull it out sometime uh they're taking their time here they, i mean i don't i can't imagine yeah. they have like i mean maybe p make can go mage they do double rogue mage and just prey on some massive crits and they actually all open at the <laughs> same time unlike that last game where they're just split opening yeah. and kind of just letting each other die because, um, I mean, the, the chance that they win with that is, like, really low. I, I wonder if Chanimal is at all kind of, like, maybe possibly flustered by Triple Rogue because he plays a lot of Wrath of Lich King and he fights Double Rogue a lot. And I know that Double <laughs> Rogue and, and Wrath can be, like, a bit of a cheese comp. And I, if they were actually taking it seriously, whether or not they could actually win with win a game here. So I, I honestly want to see them do Triple Rogue and actually try and play the game um, as opposed to kind of yeah, just so. waiting in the back dancing uh, because I actually wonder if it could could have some possible success I mean, we saw we saw was this player cam right he did not look relaxed and taking it with a laugh like he looked actually concerned yeah, about the match i would so, be uh <laughs> no really, yeah same rightfully so i mean you're a season you're a season competitor on your own right what's when's the last time you actually faced triple dps in a 3v3 match uh ironically cataclysm probably which is coming out in the near future <laughs> uh cataclysm was well, probably the last go. time so they're gonna they're locking in all their mains, but it's not a comp that's like you know probably gonna work. They got they got rogue mage lock, you know if is if is rogue mage powerful enough that they can have a healer warlock? They, you know this isn't season of discovery. He doesn't have any you know extra abilities to, to heal the team in this competition. So if they can manage to win with arcane rogue warlock, then rogue mage can really play anything. I think uh, is what they're looking to prove here in game number two. Um, but Echo, I, yeah. I'd be way less afraid of this personally if I was Echo. Um, number one, you can see at least the warlock at the start of the game as opposed to three rogues. You don't know where they are, just like sharks in the water. Um, so I would, I would imagine Echo are probably even less stressed about dealing with this matchup. Yeah, that's an easy bite to take out of the enemy team. All in all, well, black or cold, nice little uh, vacation place. I want to say, unless you don't like ghosts, then. A little bit tricky. Yeah, they all litter the too. There's a bunch of like food up on the stands and stuff. Like, right, oh, they, just, it's they didn't clean it. I don't know if I'd want to. Super messy here. with all the popcorn and stuff. That's actually insane. Well, let's see if uh, NPC can survive a little bit longer through the opener. But all in all, Echo looking to pick up a swift second point. Unless something goes horribly wrong, which is still a might. One way or another, let's get into it. It would be content. If something if something goes haywire here, they actually lose, it would definitely be content. The Warlock is now putting a port down. He's just triple rifting, nether warding, all in, blind the shaman, observer down, ship the damage on Chanimal, it looks like, is the strategy for black. They're just going all out aggression just shoving every single ability that they have and they're actually getting decent pressure they get trinket link in the opener lone tar is not playing games they get on any resolve and th if they can somehow not die in this response from waz they might actually have a win condition they force double earthen wall but the warlock has nothing and there ain't nobody coming to save him waz is all over him and i think this is lights out they actually knock him away for a moment 
Can he escape? He ports, but it's in melee range. And he's taking so much damage. He's interrupted. Here comes massive pressure. Waz gets cheap shot away. Chaos Bolt, he's trying to take that Channel with him, but it's not enough. Can they take him in a 2v3 with a Polymorph on Lone Tart? No, no way. Hellstone back to full. And it's going to be a tap out for Black at any moment. Yeah. <laughs> Waz is having a good nice time, <laughs> Yeah, now, now, he's, now he's definitely laughing. But Jox is trying to kite. P is getting unmade in the very moment as we are speaking. Nice lasso from Lontar, just uh, making sure everything gets sorted out nice and clean. That's gonna be all she wrote. Echo up 2 and O oh, and Black. Well, it looks like they are facing elimination. At least, for the moment. And then they go down to the water. Where they'll have an amazing second opportunity to run Rogue Buck, maybe. <laughs> Um, this is gonna be rough for them. Can uh, I mean, I want to see, I want to see triple rogue into the pirate P. It's not gonna lie, man. <laughs> and the, everybody has a pirate transmog. Why not triple outlaw? Just get a you know, four pirates in one game. Um, see what what Yarr. can happen there. Yarg Maisie here, but Echo are moving to match point. <laughs> They're starting to laugh it off. They were initially giving it full respect, like, hey, this could be pretty threatening. But now after game two, it's I think they've realized as long as they make an effective trade in the opener, there should be like next to no chance uh, that they're going to lose in a matchup like this. So. Lontar Channel Wall is not going to be caught off guard by the, the curveball comps that Black obviously have to come out with, um, given that their healer is not going to be able to compete here uh, in the tournament. And now that they're moving on to mm -hmm. match point, there's, there's going to be a lot of confidence uh, for them and really what can Black do. I mean, they, they can play the rogues, which I'm not sure if they even had set up or not. Um, or they can just try and do this again, but I, this didn't... The big thing... The big thing I think for Black is going to be, even though this weekend is kind of, let's be real here, uh, is going to go down, down the drain basically. From week one and making it to the upper bracket in week two, they have enough points that I think they're going to qualify for the gauntlet one way or another anyway. So they have enough time maybe to bring in a new healer, get some practice in and maybe even make a good run in the gauntlet leading up to the midseason clash. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that this is definitely going to be just a warm-up for them as they're moving forward, getting prepared for that. It's, I'm really excited for the fact that it is cross-region. Um, it's going to be really cool to yeah. see the metas that are going to collide with each other because I think NAEU have a couple of similarities overlapping, but there's also some distinct differences. I feel like there's a lot of Shadow Priest um, from NA, whereas EU mm -hmm. is a little bit more of Ellie Shaman and, and Warrior, honestly, uh, as well. So seeing the metas as well as the regions going going head-to-head -head should be a really exciting thing here for that. That finale now these teams are trying to qualify for that finale echo i think is pretty much locked in after that win for at least top three um and now black they're in the gauntlet so they're they're trying to battle and hold like a higher position in that gauntlet um but these are the comps that they're going to have available to them I mean, the best of them yeah. best luck to them but it it's going to be hard definitely yeah, overall, uh, kind of the meta, so to say. If you can even speak about a meta, right? Because oh my God, they're giving them so a hand. Many. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, never mind the meta discussion. We got an evoker, an unholy death knight coming out from Echo. Now that's an interesting turn of events. I like that. I mean, this is maybe them trying to flex a new comp, use this as an opportunity, or maybe it's them trying to make the series more interesting. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is a comp. I mean, this is a solid comp, and obviously they're really good at these classes. Yeah. Uh, but you wouldn't expect like this type of lock-in. Maybe they're trying to like just see how fast they can kill Black to a speed run here, because this would be a comp that could kill them probably the fastest of any comp that they have. Um, so they're they're bringing in Waz and the Dragon Channel on the Death Knight, uh, and then Black. They're going double rogue mage, and it's a frost mage for some reason, okay? Ooh. Frost mage double, double rogue. Block. Yeah, I guess. It, it, I mean, if he's running the block heal, yeah. it gives him, like, a full reset. He's going to have two resets. The rogues are going to have two resets. I mean, if they play this seriously, and one of them isn't, you know, RP dancing in the way, in the starting room, maybe. I mean, it's two sub rogues. I'm not going to say they don't have a chance, okay? I'm not going to say they don't. Yeah. I, a sub rogue can solo somebody, and there's two of them, so... If they actually take it seriously, maybe they can do something here. I'd be I'd be happy to see it. Uh, Waz's dragon, as far as I've heard, is a little bit infamous, uh, though, and uh, I don't think that's going to be easy to go up against. But there is a, always a chance as long as a rogue is alive. So we'll just have to see how things go. Tiger's Peak, I think, a decent map overall. Lots of space to just uh, run away and reset for black. If they play that out properly, I think there's a considerable chance, but we shall see. We'll load on the map onto the map in just a moment.
But with Echo and Match Point, well, how are you feeling about the potentially upcoming series between Shibako Tensei and Echo? Uh, I mean, that's going to be one of their biggest opponents, right? Lava Lava's in the lower bracket. It's possible that Echo gets yep. through this bracket without having to fight either team that eliminated them last week if Lava Lava <laughs> don't have a good run in the lower side. So they're likely going to be their biggest opponent, I think, for this tournament. No, I'm with you. Uh, I think uh, you and Ven were talking about it last series, right? That Shibaku might have some trouble with uh, a team bringing in a sub rogue, and was I mean, the dude has mastered every single rogue spec, so the potential is definitely there. Almost and every spec side. in the game as well. Playing a dragon now, I've never seen him play a dragon yeah, in tournaments. So, <laughs> uh, they just want to flex it. Th this comp, I mean, this comp has a lot of one shot, but it's also really susceptible to a sub rogue. I feel like an evoker. Um, th this. Yeah, you know, might not be guaranteed to them if if they're taking this um, seriously. But obviously, they have not practiced double rogue mage, and I don't know if uh, their warlock playing a rogue has like got much experience on it. So we're still kind of expecting a wash, but I, I don't want to count a subtlety rogue out ever. Uh, if they manage to actually clutch a win, assuming that Echo is actually trying and playing at full force, it would be one of the most content moments ever. Uh, I think here, so double rogue mage. And they're going to both be playing Shadowy Duel. p makes going to have two Ice Blocks. He's going to have two resets. Likely needs to respect to the Ice Block heal. You don't typically play it. So hopefully he's changed his talent tree if they want to take this um, and actually pull off a win. Channel coming in on the Death Knight. Gates are about to open. Let's see it. Echo up to and nil at the moment. And Channel just uh, riding in a charge. Looking for someone. Well, they found the mage. Himself, but so far... Oh, they found the mage. Oh, that is an insane route coming from Lontar, but the sap on Waz coming through. Double cheap shot with a polymorph on Lontar, and the damage is gonna come rolling in. Full kidney was under fire, but for the moment, the damage is uh, lacking. Pimek trinketing out of that first batch of CC, and Shoxy getting one shot immediately. The cloak is already out. Shadow Blades are running. They're looking for some damage, but the ice block coming in early here as well. Pimek just trying to stay on the offensive. Wants to bring in the polymorph, but he gets kicked on it and absolutely won. One shot, their fist up in the air. Was uh, rightfully so. Very happy about securing top three here. And in the meantime, NPC, oh. well, honoring his name here a little bit, honestly. NPC's doing the Warcraft 3 strat where you, as a night elf, you'd go and like, you'd eat <laughs> trees and go hide in the corner with your main base and make the other team confused on where you went and hope the other team would surrender <laughs> and not be able to find you. So That's a throwback and a half, he's, man. Jesus. He's just sitting in the corner hoping they don't know where he is and maybe they like leave the game accidentally or something and he can win. I don't know. Oh, because um, I mean, Shoxy is still playing this out, but there should be no way here. Oh, he's back! He's back! He's, he just wanted a one v three. He wanted the one v three clip. He's dueling Channel, and he's trying to get a highlight reel here with a one shot on Channel, but he's doing absolutely nothing. So no highlight reel for NPC, who's <laughs> just waiting for the one v three. Yeah, boss finds him, uh, swoops in, gets a cheap shot on it though. Let's see, doing a good job kiting. It's a panda rogue after all, man. If he just brings out that palm strike, this could get ugly really quickly, but uh, yeah, no, it's not gonna happen. GG's Echo takes the series 3 0. Well, let's see, we're really uh, testing you here. First day on AWC, we've given you some difficult matches. <laughs> It's uh, it's a challenge, but I am ready for it, and I am happy to take any series okay. that comes my way. You can't wait for the stat page. It's just gonna be Waz Evoker, 100% win rate. <laughs> oh God! Yes. Like, Why doesn't he play as Best Evoker? Best specs. <laughs> well, there you go, Super. Your next YouTube video for the weekend. <laughs> Why, why doesn't Waz play Evoker? 100% win rate here. Um, <laughs> I mean. I mean, maybe p -Mate can play this differently. I think he canceled his first block really early, and I don't know if he actually changed his yeah. talents. And obviously, the rogue being at the starting room waiting in stealth for whatever 1v3 moment he was hoping that could happen uh, at the re result of the game. And there was there was next to no chance of this ever actually happening for them. So not not a huge amount to cover in the video other than Waz doing an insane amount of damage. Um, and Channel just running down poor p -Mate, who's trying to 1v3 them, and it's just not happening. Echo not respecting the duel, man. Yeah, they respect the 1v1. Why didn't they send Waz in one at a time? He could duel one of them. And then whoever, you know, we could have like a, th a 3v3 1v1 <laughs> event. See? There we go. 69k damage here on Waz. That's perfect. <laughs> nice. Wow. Well. You know, I, it is an unfortunate situation. I'm glad they at least had fun with it. Uh, you can tell, you know, Waz was having a good time as well. So... 
honestly, what you can what can you do in that situation? You know, it's not the first time that we've seen uh, these teams unfortunately have to play without one of their players. So you kind of have to, you know, just get through the series one way or another. So that is going to be a victory for Echo 3-0. There's not really much else to talk about that. Uh, talk about there. That is also an upper bracket series. So Black will be moving on into the lower bracket. They'll play Pirate Pete's at the end of the day. But now that being said, we are going to do a quick segment before we do head into the break. We're going to be um, guessing some maps once again. So if you guys were not here for last weekend, we were guessing some maps in kind of the Warcraft log style that you guys may have seen circling around Twitter for the raid rooms, the uh, the raid maps. <laughs> Imagine raid they boss took rooms. that Jeez, last game. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> What's they that? Use that? Imagine they used that last game. There's just a player not moving <laughs> in the corner for the entire <laughs> Trying to figure out yeah. what map it is. Oh, boy. That would actually That's be a hard map challenge. to guess. Guess this specific series. Like... <laughs> what classes are playing but anyways let us know in chat what you think this is powered by warcraft logs as well you can head to their website if you'd like an in-depth look at your arena games and you can check this out for yourself so this is either dollar in sewers tigers peak pulveron or empyrean domain okay Let's see. it's whoever guesses it first and gets it right wins right yeah if you wait it's, it's you know it's, yeah it's not as fair otherwise you could just wait um, i think Empyrean Domain. There's a lot of open there. space. Are you actually probably going to win yeah. now? I, sh I should have just said so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, wait. The spawn the spawn position looks so weird, so I agree. It's either it's either uh, Empyrean Domain or Tiger's Peak, but Tiger's Peak doesn't match up with the with the map and the pillars here. The, they also uh, spawn on the top left and the bottom right, which could make it Dalaran, but they're not really playing in the middle. They're kind of Maybe they're playing on the stairs? On the left, now they're pulling. No, I think it's this is too big of a map. I think it's Imperium. As I well. think it's Imperium, but we can't guess it. Okay, we can't guess it because I has already locked it in. We have to hope that we're randomly tie. right with some other pick. You can tie with me. I'll, I'll, I'll tie with you. Is tying acceptable? What if it ends up being wrong though? Like, then I mean, we're all wrong. There's there is a all pillar right, where I'm, that I'm purple dollar in. There's a pillar where that purple. I'm just locking okay. in dollar in for the heck of it. You should. Yeah, Ooh. I should have locked in dollar in. I think it is. I think it's the staircase <laughs> on the top left, and I think there's oh, a no. box on the bottom left. And now they're playing around the box on the far right, top right. So like a box is going to start to form. It's going to end up being Dalaran, isn't it? Oh, it's not. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> let's go, Aya. Sheesh. Easy game, easy life. <laughs> GG easy. All right. Well, wow. let us know in chat if you were correct. And once again, shout out to Warcraft Logs for powering this segment that being said we will be heading to a break here and when we come back we're heading into the lower bracket as well it's lava lava that's an incredible team that is the team that beat out echo last weekend but unfortunately they did drop to chibaku tensei uh, and they're going to be heading off against precog enthusiasts they beat punch squad earlier on so i am really excited for the series hopefully you guys are too so real quick after this break it's lava lava versus precog enthusiasts up next
Welcome back, everyone. We are down here in the lower bracket. It is Lava Lava versus Precog Enthusiast. Lava Lava, they had an incredible series uh, tournament last weekend, and now not quite having that same success. I mean, they've only played one game. They did drop down to the lower bracket, and they're here against Pirate Pete's Lithy, a team that started off this weekend in uh, the lower bracket and won their earlier series against Hulabang. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting matchup. Uh, not quite the Pirates, but Precog Enthusiasts. Uh, they are nonetheless, I'm pretty sure, Aya. But either way, you are completely right. This is going to be an insane series. And quite honestly, an uphill battle for the Precog Enthusiasts, if I'm looking at the stakes here. Because Lava Lava, I mean, rank one on the ladder in Europe. They've come in second last weekend already. This is not a team you just beat just like that. Most definitely not. Uh, I, I feel like, I feel like a lot could go on in this series. I, I couldn't even really predict. I feel like going into this one, Zico, which team is going to come out of this? Because I feel like this is a really even matchup here. No, it really absolutely is. I mean, we've talked about this as well, like a little bit earlier when uh, Precog Enthusiasts were playing. This is such a talented roster, right? These guys have so many uh, really, really solid players. So. It is a little bit shocking to see that they had uh, kind of a rough uh, uh, patch to to get here uh, in terms of week one, but um, so far they've looked good uh, this time around. Of course, Lava Lava, super solid top two last weekend, uh, really solidifying themselves as a team that is going to be going uh, in that top three. But um, I feel like if there is one team that could upset them, it would be the Precog Enthusiasts because there's just so much individual talent um, on this roster. Yep, definitely. And, you know, something that we've been stressing so much, uh, this is kind of the last chance for these teams to get those points because um, it is cup number two, Lava Lava. They started off uh, in second place right after Hulabang. So it's really kind of precog enthusiasts, enthusiasts that um, sort of need those points more in a sense. So maybe they're a little bit hungrier. I'm not sure. Either way, we will find out here. It's game number one between Lava Lava and precog enthusiasts. Someone is getting knocked out at the end of the series all right well, let's see well well you go ahead go, would you look at that no that's a that's the first mirror of the weekend if not even this season like the first full mm. mirror we've seen because guz on the alley shaman gets mm -hmm. to play first time today and mbq immediately going in on him yeah, this, uh, I think it is actually our very, very first mirror here. And uh, already Guz is taking quite a bit of damage here. So I really wonder what the strategies are going to be. Uh, of course, when you're playing against those Resto Druids, you want to be spamming out as much swaps as possible. Hit everybody as much as you can and make sure that you're taxing the Druid's mana as much as possible. Because I do think that the swaps also to the Druid um, is really what's going to, you know, accelerate one team uh, ahead of the other one in this match. Whoever can get a good clean swaps to the Druids. Uh, is definitely going to have that in their back pocket. But right now, just the training the Ellie Shaman, both Demon Hunters CCing the healer. Jamie, though, is the one taking the uh, brunt of that exchange. Still dropping quite low here. Luxia not out of the crowd control just yet, but finally comes out, chops him up with the Nature Swiftness, summons his little tree minions. Um, and uh, Jamie's going to be completely fine with that Iron Bark as well. So it really is going to come down to mana uh, in these early stages. And so far, both Druids are pretty much tied. Luxia already looking for that first restealth. Um, it's really going to be the name of the game. Get those drinks, coffee, try to stop it, and get caught up in a Cyclone as a result. Yeah, walked straight into the Bash on the other side of the map. And of course, that's going to reduce the pressure that Lava Lava can put out quite substantially. Maybe even an opportunity for Luxia to get a drink in. But one way or another, you can already see the mana. Dex is bleeding blue as much as Jamie. Uh, sorry, Guz is on the health bar. Tree traded out on both sides once again. And S coming up here are actually already ready for Dex for the big heals. And once again, another round of CC. It's really a point where we can start looking at the defense what is up, what is coming up, what uh, do you have to rotate here? Because Jamie waiting on that shift to be ready once again. Both shamans have the burrow still available and Gaz immediately popping that shift in as Jamie throws in the primordial wave because he knows there's a meatball feast coming his way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. This is uh, looking like the, um, uh, the dining section of Ikea right now, this game. A lot of meatballs <laughs> flying all over the place here. Dex looking for the Cyclone. Not able to find it. I think it was a grounding totem that came out there in the nick of time. 
and uh, Jamie just uh, still not feeling himself. I feel like both Demon Hunters right now are just trying to get as much uptime as possible on the Shamans. Both Shamans are trying to do as much damage as possible. This is a true, in the sense, mirror, and I really expected um, either one of these teams to potentially try to go after the Druids more, but looks is going in for the Bash. There's the... Actually, there's a bit of a swap. Coffee wanted to... He wanted to take a sip there uh, on Luxia, yeah, but uh, decided not to. Still going to be Guz, who is going to be the target, and Jamie, of course. And so far, Mana, I would say it's it's not a significant lead, but I think Luxia is just a smidge ahead. Um, Jamie going to get hunted here, yeah. gets the Iron Bark there by Luxia, yeah, and uh, Jamie's going to be able to recover. It's looking really good. Big damage coming out from Jamie on every one MVQ, though. The big target down to 20%. Blur is running out. He has the Netherwalk available. Luxia is in cap. MVQ might have to Netherwalk here. Yup, there it is. The big immunity out the door. And even mana wise, both teams now evened out once again. And you saw Luxia with a little bit of an aggressive push earlier. That's the type of player he is. He likes to go in, likes to jump in for maybe a bash clone and kind of turn the game in his team's favor. But oh. sometimes that comes back to haunt you as Trank and Burrow get overlapped. Precock Enthusiast, within the span of 30 seconds here, Zico, they bleed defensives all over the place. Yeah, they used pretty much everything, but a nice cyclone there onto Guz as he gets the darkness there from Coffee. And Guz is still not out of the woods yet. Lightning Lasso coming out here from Jamie, but uh, like you said, that was a massive push here for Lava Lava. All of a sudden, uh, Precog enthusiasts have basically used every single button they have. They have the Astral Shift to work with, and Jamie might have to use it right now, actually. You know, Senna is going to proc. He's going to get some good counter pressure here. Luxia is still out of crowd control as well, uh, spamming out the heals here. But I don't know how long Jamie's going to actually be able to stay alive. He's in the darkness right now. Uh, um, from MVQ, so uh, they're just using that darkness to allow kind of Luxia to uh, just catch up with the heals. Guz is dropping quite low, but uh, does use the burrow there, so at least um, uh, precog enthusiasts do manage to force that one. Yeah, nice. Lasso on the hunt, MVQ getting cycloned on top of it. So a lot of the uh, Demon Hunter damage just taken out. Meanwhile, they're running down Jamie without mercy. And Lava Lava so far. I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed with their performance and after that series with uh, against uh, Jibako Tensei, they really needed to bounce back, they need to refocus and put on a performance because they are still in the running for that top three spot for the midseason clash. And with a kill on Gus, that would go down the drain, but for the moment, Jamie is the actual man in danger and with a fire early out, he's trying to bounce back a little bit, the lightning lasso shutting down Gus for just a second and more uh, meatballs to come. And Luxia stabilizing him quite nicely, but how long can the enthusiasts hold on to this lead they have at the moment? Yeah, that is the big question here. Luxia pushing in for more crowd control. He gets the Cyclone onto Guz, but look at Jamie taking more and more damage. Dex almost out of mana. Luxia almost out of mana. The hunt getting casted by Coffee. He's sitting through a root right now. He is going to backflip back to Jamie. There's the hunt. Big damage connects here onto Jamie. He's dropping quite low, and that will be the instantaneous burrow there coming out uh, for Jamie. Guz still doesn't have his burrow uh, back just yet, but that was a good uh, exchange of cooldowns there. Good push here, and uh, it's really going to come down to the wire here. I don't know which one of these teams is actually going to take this one, Liffy. Oh, Mana is running low, Zico. This is not looking good for either side. It's really going to come down to the defensives that are left. MVQ waiting on the Netherwalk for another 20-second shift just used by Gus. He is the prime target. He is in big danger, and Dex has uh, nothing to give except for a little bit more mana and that NS. Now he's out, and MVQ sitting in another Cyclone. Gus, who needs to fear for his life right now. Five seconds on that burrow. If he can stay alive that long, he is going to be fine for just another moment, and it comes off cooldown and immediately Ooh. presses it. Dex has that innervate. It trinkets the stun instantly. No time wasted at all. And now the pressure is onto Jamie's same situation, oh. but he has never the borrow and there's the damage coming and Jamie goes down and lava lava taking the blind pick. Lava lava showing who is the stronger mirror team right here. And I mean that was that was a really really close game, especially um, if you look at the damage uh, dealt it was very even um, across both teams. Mana was pretty even, but it really does come down to who has what cooldown at the end of the game, when the healers are, are hurting on mana, when dampening is starting to really uh, become too much for them to handle, who has defensives at that point, who still has a burrow, who still has an astral shift, and that's what we see uh, towards the end here.
Uh, Jamie getting extremely aggressive uh, and Guz and Jamie both using their astral shift but the big difference between Guz and Jamie is of course that three seconds left two seconds left on that uh, top right icon under Guz there it is the burrow back off cooldown it's gonna buy Guz enough time here to uh, survive and allow his heater to come out of crowd control and then they come out and just immediately start blasting here and uh, they get a wind shear offensively there by Jamie onto decks but Guz is just tearing in the CC is there as well with the bash and the uh, extra fear and yeah just uh, overall solid uh, synergy and uh, you can see it uh, on the yeah. damage as well MVQ and Jamie um, and Coffee and Guz super close to each other uh, really almost no difference and Dex and Luxia as well so really um, really solid game here from Lava Lava it's 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 also something that I've noticed over the years of watching AWC myself, right? It it in a lot of matches and especially these mirrors, it comes down to super minor details. And while I don't think you can call a overlap of Nether Warg and Burrow and uh, Trank, for example, a minor overlap, I think it's one of the turning points in this match that we need to talk about, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, you cannot have those defensive overlap. Well, at some points in dampening, you kind of have you're forced to start overlapping your cooldowns just because dampening is so high. But um, you know, yeah. prior to to getting to those situations, like aside from those like kind of extreme examples, uh, you should uh, never really try to overlap those cooldowns, and uh, that's what it comes down to, right? Uh, you get the pressure, you get the good swaps, you, you get the CC chains, you force the cooldown, you hold on to your cooldowns, and then you don't overlap them. You try to greed them as much as possible. So much of this game uh, does really come down to how you use those cooldowns, when you use them, uh, when you save them. And, uh, uh, of course, if you ever end up overlapping like uh, a lot of big cooldowns like we saw, I think what you're talking about is the moment where like Luxia had to trade out his Tranquility and Jamie had to trade out basically his whole spellbook as well, like in one push. Um, situations like that, uh, if that happens, it is so bad. Because even if you get those cooldowns back, um, you, you burn desync, through so right? much mana and they're desynced, yeah. Yeah. And from here on out, I think this series is going to just get more exciting because we, we lock in Empyrean Domain right away, both teams are running the same comp. This is just going to be the, nah, I'd win kind of situation for both teams here, right? Yep. And, and both teams are sticking with, these, uh, with this mirror. So uh, I kind of like that, you know. Uh, both of them are just like, you know what? We have other options. You have other options. Let's just send a mirror and see who is actually the better team. Um, right now, Lava Lava looking like that team. Up 1-0 and zero already up against the Precog Enthusiasts. Uh, match number two here going to be Empyrean Domain. And I don't think maps are going to matter too much. It might benefit a certain playstyle a little bit more. But, you know, uh, this is a dead-on mirror. So uh, we'll see who can actually find those advantages. Again, we're going to see the, those LA Shamans uh, really uh, being tested oh. here by the Demon Hunters. Look at Coffee's cooldowns. He is running the uh, the big sigil and fell barrage. That's a very different setup here compared to MVQ. Huh? Yeah, you don't usually see the fell barrage actually uh, selected there for Coffee, but that's interesting. We'll see if uh, Coffee if he has more damage done uh, as a result of that, or if they can get like some big burst because of it. That's uh, definitely something that we need to pay attention to. Um, but for now, Guz still trying to get aggressive here. MVQ dropping quite low. Guz doing a good job here, just spamming out the purge, spamming out the damage. Um, but MVQ will recover. And uh, so far, I don't think either team is really ahead. Jamie has used his trinket astral shift, so... Uh, and so has Guz, yeah. so yeah, I would say it's pretty even. Yeah, Guz coming in with the uh, with a dwarf racial there to get out of that uh, set of CC and just the pure burst coming through. And for the moment, I think it's the very same as on Negrand. We'll keep an eye on the healers. You can see the Earthquake down to disrupt Luxia from a drink, just making sure the healers are even in mana. And so far, Dex a little bit behind on the blue bar. And in terms of cooldown rotations, well, that's the part we need to watch out for, right? Guz mm -hmm. already used the Astro Shift, same as Jamie. The big question really for me, how impactful are the changes to the talent tree going to be from Coffee? Is that Fel Barrage really going to contribute a substantial amount of cleave damage that it drains Luxia's mana even more. And with the fire elemental out, Jamie, of course, looking to put the herd on, but for the moment, he is the big target. Down to half, pops the Astro Shift as soon as it comes off cooldown with a Primordial Wave. Now, eyeing up gas, 
And he is taking a boatload of meatballs, just uh, dropping that IKEA blind here for the moment. And uh, Dex having a really hard time to stabilize, the, stabilize this whole situation. Yeah, but look at Jamie, though. Jamie's got nothing left here. He's got the burrow. He might have to use it here. Dropping quite low. Looks at spamming out the regrowths here. Uh, looks at with the iron bark as well. And this is one of those situations, right? You're low. You have a defensive cooldown, but you don't overlap it. Looks at comes in with the iron bark, and he says, you're fine. And we can see the fell barrage there actually uh, doing a decent amount of damage to Jamie. I actually do wonder how much um, that fell barrage is uh, going to end up doing because so far coffee is ahead on damage not by like a lot but you know he is a million uh, ish uh, ahead there uh, compared to mvq almost two actually so uh it might be the fell barrage making a big difference there guys right now taking quite a beating there in the back line and the though sitting through that frost chalk route and uh, manages to make it back to his targets both shamans so far just trying to stay alive from this demon hunters nice cyclone there onto guz um by luxia so gonna be just uh, pausing the damage there a little bit and that was on the iron bark of dex so uh, when you know that guz is not going to be really a good target you can cyclone him and um you can get back to him later absolutely and for the moment oh my god that's a lot of pressure on jamie forcing that burrow out he has the shift back in five seconds and Maybe that's a little bit of a window with the Essence Break. Coffee trying to make something happen here, and it's looking good. But Gaz on the other side gets traded out for his burrow just the same. Dex popping in that Innovate. Luxia already having used his. And the follow-up fear here on the Dispel knockup is going to put Dex on the bench for just a few moments here. In the meantime, Jamie has to trade the shift, trying to get more damage in with the Primordial Wave coming up. This might actually happen. Where is the damage? Where are the meatballs? They're flying in. Gus is the big target. He's just chilling on the shift. It does not want to trade it here for the moment as things seem to be fine for Lava Lava. Going deeper into dampening, we're hitting the four minutes almost as Gus gets incapped on sub half HP with a shift up. And Jamie under fire, trinkets and Zico. He is not looking good right now. Yeah, things are not looking good for Jamie right now. Looks just uh, sitting through a kick. Darkness does get dropped there by MVQ in the nick of time. That will be enough to sustain uh, Jamie. But look, they're swapping to Luxia, and I really like these Druid swaps now. Luxia uh, sitting in bear form. They're gonna fell erupt looks they're going after mvq here on the other side and um it looks like uh, mvq is going to get cycloned low here so looks he has a lot of work ahead of him look at the pressure onto jamie look at the pressure onto mvq how is he going to prioritize his healing here guys in a bash guys gonna trink it out gets the iron bark here as well so guys is gonna be able to continue to fire out those meatballs like a michelin star chef right now um, but he is taking quite a few meatballs as well here from uh, jamie oliver here and uh, jamie is gonna be able to recover and and uh, just continue trucking on here in the kitchen. Wait, did you bring up good meatballs and Jamie Oliver in the same sentence? Is that allowed? <laughs> Anyway, uh, Jamie taking more of a beating here. It's both shamans actually dying right then and there where they are standing. Big heals coming through from both druids. Looks here popping in the tree. Has an S coming up. Dex has that one ready as well. Once again, getting chain CC'd by MVQ with the fierce sigil. And for the moment, you can see Gaz are really kiting away, forcing Luxia out of position. He gets incapped. The swap onto Jamie, forcing the shift once again. And overall, you can really tell Lava Lava taking more and more control of this game, of this map, by positioning in a very, very unfortunate way for Precog enthusiasts. Yeah, absolutely. Things are not looking too good right now for the Precog enthusiasts. Mana's not looking too hot on either side, though. Guz still taking a lot of damage. A double lasso coming out right now. Jamie and Guz just kind of mirroring each other's moves. MVQ still quite low, though. Dex caught up in a Chaos Nova. They need to be careful on the side of Lava Lava. Looks yet pre-barks that CC chain. Looks yet oh, completely tapped. Dex still has just a little bit of mana to work with, and that might just be the damage differential here coming in from Coffee and Guz. But Guz, Ramsey needs to be careful. The meatballs are flying in but he's also dishing them out here <laughs> onto mvq where is jamie oliver he's trying to sprinkle some as well from above but not able to find it just yet mvq still down to 50 percent hp jamie down to 50 percent hp jamie is going to use the burrow there to stay alive but he cancels it early they're swapping to mvq mvq gets stunned guz looking for it he's looking to turn him into a sandwich here but not able to find it just yet guz dangerously low but the darkness i think that's his darkness actually he gets imprisoned on the darkness guz will hold on and having that darkness this late into the game is absolutely massive but still not out of the wood yet guys dropping quite low here and there is the burrow he's going for the burrow kill and he's gonna find it what lava lava coming in with the hot 2 and zero right now up against precog enthusiasts in this mirror match man
second burrow kill of the season already. Lava Lava putting the enthusiasts into Hell's Kitchen right here. <laughs> this is an insane matchup. You were sitting on that one, dude. <laughs> I was, I was. I was just waiting for you to hand it off. <laughs> Okay, we got, we got, we, okay, 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 we got, we got to calm down right now. <laughs> we both getting fired right now. <laughs> let's, let's see here, but. Put the burner one level lower. That's going to be fine. <laughs> but this is, this is really good pressure though here from pre cog Enthusiasts. Yeah. But this is what we were talking about earlier, right? If you are ahead in the match, you force out that darkness a little bit earlier. Then when things get this unstable, look, she has no mana and you really need uh, one of those big defensives to, to be able to come and save the day. This is where things is just different right god still has his uh wait look at his kill Boop! coming out there uh, <laughs> with the with the little burrow kill uh, burrow actually hits really hard um yeah it does so this is a second burrow kill that we've seen we saw absturge actually kill uh someone with it as well um last weekend but uh burrow does hit really hard and the fact that Gus had you know those defensives at this point in the game uh yeah lava lava definitely happy about that yeah, and generally, it's just a really good game by both teams once again, right? We talked a little bit about the overlapping of CDs in Game 1, but that I didn't see any of that here in Game 2. I think both teams played this basically as clean as you could. But overall, I do think Lava Lava just working a little bit better on the side of positioning. And overall, uh, I did poke our stat team to maybe, uh, to maybe get some interesting things on the Demon Hunters here. So, for example... Coffee's Fel Barrage did 1.2 million damage, mm. and you see on the kill, they contributed about equally, Coffee and Guz. Uh, and overall, Coffee did around about 5 million damage more than MVQ in this last match. That's crazy, actually. I mean, I feel like Coffee in general, he has been so impressive on the Demon Hunter. He's been really uh, putting his team on his back in a lot of these situations, and... I mean, this is, so this is pre-cog enthusiasts. These are some of the absolute best of the best at these classes. And Lava Lava, man, like, Dex is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Luxia. Yeah, Guz is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jamie and, and Coffee as well against MVQ. Uh, really, really high-level play that we can see here um, from these guys. And, uh, well, I mean, what are you going to do if you're pre-cog enthusiasts? They're just going to lock in the mirror once again here. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like I feel You're like Lava Lava is just a. I feel like Lava Lava is just a little bit cleaner right now with this. They have a little bit better synergy. They have a little bit better like uh, match idea, but can never count out precog enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always a always a question of how how practiced are you? And I mean, you've got to be honest, right? Lava Lava coming into this season last weekend as the number one team on the ladder, so you know these guys have been grinding like crazy this uh, these past few weeks and months right and matching up against that that's not an easy task even if you are a <laughs> team of kind of seasoned veterans like jamie like someone like luxia and meq has been around uh for a few months and years as well so mm -hmm. overall it's a nerf wrecker of a matchup and especially if you're kind of pushed onto your mains and backs to the wall on match point in a skill mirror that's not an easy spot to be in no, absolutely not. Uh, and, and that's the thing, right? Uh, I don't know, actually, on the standings, how things have been going so far uh, for precog enthusiasts. Um, but uh, They're they, looking they, pretty decent. I mean, I think they're basically confirmed for the gauntlet at this point. Um, it's more about the seeding now. Yeah. Uh, it's, let me see here. Uh, yeah, precog enthusiasts are, uh, are looking good. So um, for, for them, obviously... The higher seeding you get, the less games you have to play in the gauntlet. So uh, if you're just tuning in or you don't know what's going on, basically, top three will qualify to the mid-season clash, which is our big tournament. Then rank four to eight, they will all play in a gauntlet. And whoever wins that gauntlet, that's the team that will be the fourth team uh, into uh, you know, the mid-season clash. And the way the seeding works is if you finish the season in eighth place, you face seventh. Whoever wins that faces the sixth place. Whoever wins that faces the fifth place and so on. So even if you don't qualify auto and you like finish the season fourth, um, you still only have to win that one game and then you're qualified. Whereas if you finish eighth, you have to go through the entirety of the gauntlet. Um, so definitely... Uh, 
try to play try, try to win as much as possible get as many points as possible and hopefully you can just win maybe one or two games in the gauntlet and still make it into that tournament uh, but it's yeah. a long way right now uh, for um, uh, precog enthusiasts because well they're down 0 and two right now Liffy exactly and well in the hot sands of Uldum, that's where we'll leave one of the teams buried six foot deep. But for the moment, <laughs> hey, it's a scale matchup. It's down to the Shamans, it's down to the Demon Hunters. And I'm really curious how MVQ is going to adapt. Because, uh, quite honestly, if you're just looking at the numbers, there was so much more that Coffee was able to do uh, last game. And in terms of talents, yeah, look at it. We got adaptations coming in from MVQ. There is the big sigil. No yep. Felbarash, though. So let's see what he can do. Uh, uh, MBQ just uh, going to opt for a little bit more pump here, and we'll see uh, if it's going to be enough here. Jamie, Luxia, and MBQ looking to make their stand here against Lava Lava. And Lava Lava, uh, this is the map that they knocked down Echo to the lower bracket last week. So uh, they've had uh, some good results on this map. Let's see if it actually stays in here. I do want to see maybe uh, Precog Enthusiasts go after Dex more, and that's exactly what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Big Chaos Nova here onto Dex. They force out the Bark Skin, but unfortunately for Dex, um, he has Innervate right now, so he's going to be able to heal everybody for free. But if they can do more swaps like that, definitely going to burn his mana, Lithy. Yeah, absolutely. Look, see, uh, taking the brunt of that first uh, attempt as well. Gus getting in light really quickly on that lasso by Jamie. Good reactions. And, of course, they're going to continue the pressure. Overall, you can already tell that MVQ is starting to pump a good chunk more damage. It's more about the kind of uh, the emulation aura than anything else with the build uh, he is running now, I think. And that's just going to help you trying to keep the damage up while you're running after people instead of just throwing glaives at everyone, right? But then again, I'm not the biggest demon hunter expert over here, and uh, I'll leave that to the experts. But all in all, it's an iron bark from Luxia. He gets incapped on that, sitting there in bear form. Dex is fine for the moment. All in all, cooldowns traded on both sides, and once again, Zico. We're just waiting for dampening, at least a little bit more dampening. Uh, we are waiting for a little bit of dampening, but we're also waiting to be in the best position possible when dampening hits, because that's what happened last time, right? If you get into dampening yeah. and it starts stacking up and you don't have darkness, you don't have like those long, really safe cooldowns that can just stop damage, that's when you're going to find yourself in a difficult situation. Um, so we'll see here if Guz can get enough damage rolling here and try to force some of those cooldowns like they could in that previous um, matchup. And right now, Luxia getting tested here. Not even using his Barks can actually. Luxia on that Resto Druid. Uh, absolute menace here on the Resto Druid. Does manage to get the gouge into the bash. Or sorry, the, <laughs> the bash into the cyclone gouge. I don't know where I got that from. I don't think you can gouge Luxia, uh, at least from what I've heard. Can't Jamie. blame you with all those rogues, man. <laughs> it's a definitely a little bit of a rough spot. Gus, though, taking a lot of damage. Has the burrow chilling for the moment, though. Complete faith in your healer is definitely something you need if you want to compete at the top of the ladder here in the AWC. And in the top six, where we are right now, I think you can rely on them, on your communication. Everything has to be on point. A barrage coming in from Coffee, looking for more damage, but guys, it's the big target. Accessory Guidance is popped in, but the Burrow as well. So, big cooldowns thrown out here from Lava Lava, and it seems like slowly but surely the momentum shifting a little bit more towards the Enthusiasts, especially with the uh, mana being in Luxia's favor. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Luxia's mana looking pretty good so far, but it has in the other games too. I'm really curious to see who's going to get those big defensives forced first. I think Darkness is going to be probably the most important cooldown right now uh, in terms of defense here. So whoever can get that uh, cooldown used first is going to be in a great spot. And a great way to force it is to get on top of those Druids because a lot of those Demon Hunters, they want to use it to try to save their Druid. Um, so that could definitely be big moving forward. But uh, MBQ right now taking quite the beating here. But MBQ is going to be completely fine going uh, over back onto Guz here. Chaos Nova connects. Here's the damage. Jamie is there as well, getting a little bit of uh, pressure there. And Jamie as well taking a little bit of a beating here from Coffee. And uh, Luxia caught up in the Chaos Nova. They're going after Jamie here. Do they have any more crowd control for Luxia? Luxia actually forced to trade out his trinket there. Good chain. And this, are the, this, is the, this is when the game starts to really become unstable here for both teams. So forcing out the cooldowns right now is ideal uh, for either one of these teams. 
Yeah. Oh, oh FQ girl dropping low. He doesn't have the netherwalk anymore. The darkness is going down. He's actually like in a one shot. <gasps> what the hell just happened? Oh what? my god. Lava, lava popping off. <laughs> lava, lava making quick work out of precog enthusiast. I blinked for a split second and that was just it. Lava, lava, man. Where did these guys just come from? I mean, you've seen them on the ladder, but. This team newly formed and consistently performing. This is uh, very, very impressed with these guys. Uh, but we can actually take a look at and, and break down exactly what did happen. So this was a little bit earlier. This is when uh, I think Luxia trinketed. So MVQ right now has no trinket and no nether walk. Uh, Luxia has no iron bark. They get a CC chain onto Luxia in a second and they go after Jamie. So here's the CC chain. They get the Chaos Nova. They get the imprisonment. Luxia trinkets to save Jamie. And to not fall behind on the healing. So at this point, MBQ has no trinket, no dark, uh, no nether walk, and uh, Luxia doesn't have a trinket either. Uh, so they get good pressure here onto MVQ, and then they just I beam, and he dispels a flame shock. He drops the darkness. Ooh, that is that is extremely tough luck with the darkness. <laughs> yeah. That's that's got to be one yeah. of the worst well, darkness RNGs I've ever seen. Uh, so if you don't know what darkness does, darkness gives you a chance that if you get hit by an ability, it does no damage while you're standing in it. I think it's like 80% chance that if I shoot, for example, a Frostbolt, it will just do no damage and just get absorbed by the darkness. And it has a chance to also do full damage. So it's a bit of RNG there, but it looked like MVQ dropped that darkness pretty healthy. It was like 30% or 20% and he just got zapped through it. Yeah. Well, we'll dig it. We'll dig into that. I'm I'm very curious to see the uh, death recap on that in a second. But yeah, lava, lava. I mean, not necessarily there. a big surprise, but definitely a convincing victory. And well, basically, it's surprising that they won this convincingly after Shibaku Tensei basically gave them a beating. So overall, you can tell lava, lava. They are not done yet this weekend, and they definitely want a stab at the top three and to lock in that uh, midseason clash spot. But all in all, you can see the Demon Hunters very even on, next to each other in terms of damage this game mm -hmm. around. Yeah, and that's uh, probably because he swapped his talents around uh, to make him more like coffees, yeah. right? With the uh, big sigil. We can see the death log here. Look at... Wait, there's no darkness absorbs. Wait, he actually darked at like 20%. Maybe it just shows the damage taken. Maybe it doesn't show uh, like if something got absorbed. Oh, consume soul. Maybe... Oh, no, that's his uh, demon proct. Oh, yeah, there so... it shows. Death sweep from coffee hits zero. So he absorbed one death sweep. Is that it? Apparently, apparently, the darkness did about 400k healing and a bit hmm. in those final moments. And based on just the damage that oh, came yeah. in, right? That's more than enough to still kill your Demon Hunter if he's sitting uh, below half HP. And as you mentioned earlier, right? I think really it comes down to this trinket from Luxia earlier. No, no heals available and you can, you can tell. There's one regrowth coming in. Two and a half seconds before he dies, and there's nothing else. Yeah, I mean, I think they purge his uh, his hots as well. It was just a really good uh, swap from Lava Lava, and honestly, the darkness did yeah. uh, did do some healing. I mean, when you zoom in like this, you can see it. It did around almost four hundred thousand healing. So, um, yeah, okay, maybe not the worst uh, darkness RNG. It almost did four hundred thousand healing, um, but still, it was it was so fast. I, I guess they just had a lot of damage at the right time, and uh, that's what makes Lava Lava. Well, lava, lava. Yeah. Indeed. They're running hot. Sorry. Go ahead, Aya. No. No, I <laughs> was kind of going to say the same thing. I mean, you know, we did see them lose their series earlier today, but now I feel like then they, they just had a really convincing performance against uh, Precog Enthusiast here, Lithy. Do you feel like now more convinced that Lava Lava could go even further and go back to the Grand Finals again on Sunday? There's definitely a potential. So the big thing for me with the remaining teams we have is one, of course, Shibako Tensei looking absolutely insane this weekend already. I did not expect them to beat Lava Lava this convincingly. Um, and the other question, of course, we didn't really see anything out of Echo earlier just now. This series against Black, it was a little bit of a, uh, a blowout, so to say. So I have no idea how strong Echo is actually this weekend, but l last weekend they looked good, but not good enough to beat Lava Lava. So for me currently, it's Chibako Tensei on top, Lava Lava in second, and Echo probably taking third, but I am more than ready to be surprised on Sunday. Yeah, I... 
I keep saying and I keep repeating myself, but like EU has just been so fun to watch. There's so many like new teams, yes. new rosters, players that are just coming to the AWC. Um, and it's just, it's really exciting to see everything unfold. So uh, Lava Lava, they're going to be heading into the lower finals and we'll see them again on Championship Sunday. But that is going to wrap up that series. And that means that we are going to head to yet another map here we're going to do another map guesser before we do head to a break and move Ooh. into the next series Ooh, yeah i'm into um, the committee so, uh, yeah, okay okay <laughs> i i won the next one or the last one i was pretty quick with it uh but yeah. you weren't in that round so we'll see if, we, if you can beat me this time but warcraft logs uh powered this segment so thank you so much to them this one is either tiger's peak maldraxxus the grand arena or lordaeron it's tiger's peak you're just going to hard commit Ooh. instantly, Tiger's Peak? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you said you, you would send it, and I'm sending it as well. I'm sending... Shit, wait, I need to think. I'm, se I'm, I'm sending... Mm, mm, ah, is it? I think it actually is Tiger's Peak. <laughs> I'm sending Maldraxxus, I... but I think it's Tiger's Peak. But I'm sending Maldraxxus because I don't want to be, uh, you know, I don't want to just... I'm gonna... Uh, now it's just me. I feel like I feel like I don't know. I'll throw out. I'll throw out in a grand. It's for sure, Tigers. Oh, it's kind of pillar. big for a grand, huh? <laughs> you can see the massive pillar <laughs> where like the tiger statue is. <laughs> the big hole, you know. Why, why couldn't it be in a grand? <laughs> because the the pillars should be four pillar differently. Yeah, the, there should be there should be four pillars. I get, maybe they haven't ran around okay. all of them. Whatever. I That's think what I think saying. it's Tigers Peak, it but I'm gonna. I'm, I, have, I have officially casted my vote as Maldraxxus, but okay. it's Tiger Speak. Oh, I thought you said, oh. Let's go. Cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm not going to change it. Like, Smarter than me. <laughs> Very well done. We've had so much fun with these last weekend already on the Adrian. They are. <laughs> these are awesome. I enjoy it. Yeah, these are amazing. Good time. All right. Well, if you got it right, let us know in chat. And with that, we are going to head to yet another break here. Thank you so much to Warcraft Logs. If you'd like to take a deep dive into your arena games, you can head over to the Warcraft Logs website uh, and take a look at all of the handy dandy features, including this one over on Warcraft Logs. So thank you so much. We will be going to a break. We will be right back with yet another elimination series. Up next is Black versus Pirate Pete's.
Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are on the very last series of the day here for Friday's games before we head into tomorrow in North America. It's going to be another elimination round. And uh, this one, this one's going to be uh, similar to maybe the one that we saw earlier. It's Black versus Pirate Pete's. Unfortunately, they still are missing their healers. So who knows what comps they're going to play then. I uh, saw some fun ones <laughs> against their series against Echo, but uh, it's going to be difficult for them for sure. Yeah, it turns out healers are pretty good. So I, I don't know if yeah. one of them can alt it, but <laughs> it's definitely uh, an important role to have. So uh, unfortunate for Black, but they could run some different... Uh, three DPS compositions. We saw them run double rogue mage. Not really finding the most success. I feel like triple DPS is kind of old tech. Like yeah. how effective healers are and how good you know defensive cooldowns are and stuff like that. Like getting kind of cheese kills with three DPS is a really hard thing to pull off. But it is possible. Um, however, they're going up a pretty against a pretty difficult opponent here in Pirate Pete's. I don't think that, I don't know. I'm just saying it right now. I don't think they're pulling this off. But P makes coming in. I was like, is that a resto druid? No, it's a boomkin. Okay, boomkin destro makes sub rogue. Like a different, a different class for every game. Boomkin destro sub rogue versus demo outlaw holy priest. One of the hardest classes for triple DPS, I would imagine, to take down in the opener. They're just shipping incarnation at Gelu, and Clyde is immediately into angel form, immune to all CC and damage, healing up his teammates and making them completely immune to death at the moment. And I think they're just going to ram P make in a second here as his bark skin fades. He ducks into bear form. He's going to wrap around the pillar with that heart of the wild. Uh, they're just. You know, just trying to survive the opener here with no healer, obviously. It's going to be pretty tough for them to do it. He's just trying to kite the rogue, uh, but Nixie is still right on top of him. Nixie's just going to cloak of shadows and go for the kill here. Cheap shot, no trinket. Shoxy intervenes with a cheap shot of his own, but Nixie just trinkets out to close it out. And one more tick of literally anything, and P-Make will die, as it looks like he's holding on by a thread and will die to the ticks there from Gelu. Um, and, yeah, I, uh, I don't think Black, <laughs> as much as I want to say there is a chance... Uh, I don't it's a think slim chance. You know, even like one in a million is still a chance, right? It's like that Dumb and Dumber scene where he's like, "Would you marry me?" And then it's like, <laughs> "So there's a chance?" It's like, no, I don't think. Are you saying there's a there's chance? There's a chance. I don't think there is. Uh, don't. <laughs> this is this is a rough run for them. The, I mean, the boom can definitely. So far, it's that comp has lasted them the longest. If we want to say anything in terms of them making ground. The Heart of the Wild, Double Frenzied Regen, Hellstone. Like, he does have a decent amount of healing. We see there down at the uh, healing meters. P-Make was able to get off about 1 million heals and have a, a fairly aggressive start. Actually, Nixie was pretty close to going down here. Of course, they had Void Shift still and the Guardian Spirit. But, yeah, nice sap there by Shoxy, too. It's a sap there. But, yeah, it's like we said. I think for Black, this is going to be an incredibly difficult matchup, unfortunately. Pirate Pete's are looking good. This is a really strong team, and they're playing durable classes as well, right? Like having that Holy Priest, just the fact that you can't even be crowd controlled at the beginning of the game, you can just go into that Spirit of the Redeemer and just bomb out heals. Like it's going to be pretty difficult to pull off a win. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess they actually did kind of get close, though. This duel yeah, at right? the end. Could, <laughs> could something the have replay? gone different for Shoxy at the end that he would have actually been able to finish this? He cheap shots the trinket, and then he duels, and he's coiled in the duel. And why oh, could Shoxy not so kill him? Cool. A battle master. Huh? He battle mastered. Yeah, he, he actually would have died there, I think, or at least cheat death would have procked. But the battle master saved him at the last second. So I mean, that that's definitely the closest game. I feel like that was like the most serious game they've played so far. So maybe if they bring something else in here, um, I mean, if you were gonna if you were gonna run a triple DPS comp, I would think that it would have to have some sort of hybrid that has like significant healing. I don't know if Boomkin is like. Triple the Og. Best. Triple Og. That was actually a real comp at one point, I swear. A triple Og? Yeah, the, not the double? three augmentation of Ogres. Yeah, not double. Triple Augmentation it was a comp last season when Augmentation was first kind of implemented. There was a team that ran it at actually really high ratings in North America at least, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, I don't think I have they my doubts. prepared. I mean, you gotta you gotta make your character, you gotta gear up your character, right? You gotta like go to the vendor, set up all of its keybinds. So, I'm not imagining that they've had a huge amount of time. I mean, the fact that P Make actually has a boomkin that it looks like it's got all of its keybinds ready to go is like probably more prep than I think we're going to expect for them to to be able to to mix this up here. They're going with the same comp. It was so far the closest comp that they have gotten, and it is a subtlety rogue. So, if if Shoxy can catch somebody with a duel. Um, 
it's definitely going to be maybe an opportunity for them. It's obviously going to be pretty pretty happy for the Pirate Peets, right? They get more chances to earn points, given that we just um, eliminated uh, Luxia's team. Um, this means that Pirate Peets actually have a chance to like start running up some ranks in the gauntlet uh, and start collecting some like you know some serious likelihood of being able to qualify into the cross region finals. Well, let's see what they can do. It's looking good. Like you said, we're going to Black Rock Hold. So Black's going to be selecting a smaller map and uh, trying to pull off a win. They're going to have to win in basically the first minute. It's so difficult. But the way the game is now, playing these triple DPS compositions, uh, you just a lot of these specs don't have the, the longevity you kind of need. There's a lot of defensive cooldowns you can rotate through, but your ability to fully recover, especially against things like a Demonology Warlock and an Outlaw Rogue, who are so good at just kind of pushing the pace and keeping up the consistent damage, uh, it's really difficult. So if Black wants to win this... Whoa. Oh, we got a Hunter, okay. Not any hunter, a survival hunter. Let's see if he can survive. Is there ever a world where they would just like 1v1 each other? Like just type in like, you guys want to decide this on 1v1s and Gelu runs in and 1v1 somebody? It's probably not. If I was Pirate Peets, I wouldn't. I would just take this and get some points in the race. There's no way I would try and risk it at all here. p makes just running in and tanking the damage face first in Boomkin form. Popping Barkskin. He's met by a lot of demons. I don't know if you want to face check the Burning Legion right now. He's taking a huge amount of damage. I think he's just going to go down and get dropped by Gelu in the opener. He's trying to jump back into the room. He's got Heart of the Wild available, but he's still not pressing it. It. They cheap shot Nixie, but Pimix just gonna flop, and there is no chance that. Well, yeah, there is no chance that Nixie is going down. He keeps getting these saps off his go. I don't. Know he keeps doing. That. <laughs> it's literally after his cheap shot, he saps him at the end of the go. Um, they got every cooldown from Nixie, but I mean that's obviously not. There's not enough opportunities here for them to be able to win the game off this. Yeah, I mean that's a good start there by Gelu, just like matching. As the two DPS team, you definitely want to match that offense, right? So he got really aggressive early on. We'll see it. I think it was like a coil. Uh, he ended up trinketing a coil, and then he got, um, what was that? Like a Felgard got summoned on him. <laughs> that stunned him. Out of that, he got coiled. So I just thought, or he got howled. A, a lot of instant crowd control coming in. So I guess you can't have coil and howl, but yeah, lots of instant crowd control. You can see exactly how it played out. He may going to be bark getting early on, but let's see what Gelu does here. Um, he gets the stun. He makes going to trinket that and uses bark skin immediately. Uh, gets howled on his trinket and stunned by that Felguard. And he just is too low. I mean, he, it'll maybe last a little bit longer if he went into bear form and got off some frenzied regen, but pretty much hopeless at this point of the game when in the first 10 seconds you're 10% health. Yeah, there wasn't really a chance here. I, I don't know what they're thinking with the survival hunter, just like the extra instant CC. You know, in the past, triple, the best triple DPS comps did have like hunter, rogue, and then a hybrid. I think it was like Ret Paladin Hunter Rogue. Um, so maybe that's what they were thinking with this. Um, but there's just so many cooldowns now in the modern game that, you know, you know, Triple DPS in the past, if they got your trinket and they instantly CC'd you again, they could just win the game off that. But now that you've got a lot more options than just that to trade. So it's going to be pretty hard as Triple DPS. Um, but I, I don't know. Maybe if he pressed Heart of the Wild, maybe if he tried to reduce the damage he was taking there and root the pets and run away, maybe Shoxy and NPC actually get like maybe a reset and they can go again or something in the future. Um, Cause I, I don't know about p -Make just like running in out of stealth. Like the advantage too is they have triple stealth. I actually wonder if there's some world where this comp can actually win now. If you played like really seriously and you were actually a main on all these specs, am I really doing this now to, to, to everybody? And I, I actually wonder if they could win. It's He's not actually playing gnome priest so they can root in the priest, they can trap the priest and they can blind the priest. And you, I feel like you could actually kill the rogue think so i legitimately I mean, think they could kill the rogue in this matchup if if p make is playing a little bit more seriously than this where he's kind of just running you in know, out of stealth i uh i admire your <laughs> uh, i admire your positivity here for uh black but i, I think this one is pretty much done and dusted at this point <laughs> pirate pizza is uh looking like they're gonna 3-0 this series um it is possible i mean maybe they could i, I think what it would come down to is pirate pizza had to completely choke like <laughs> I think if Clyde was to go down, it would just be not pressing any kind of buttons. Um, but as long as they react appropriately, and it seems like they are. I mean, they're playing triple orc, so they're, the chances of them dying in stuns is much lower. They're playing Emblem and Hellstone. You know, <laughs> Gelu is going to be able to unending resolve in Dark Pact um, and stuns. Nixie, of course, is going to be that orc road. If he cloaks, he's going to survive. If he vanishes, he's going to survive. Clyde has a bunch of answers as well. 
So I hate to be I hate to be that guy, but I feel like this is gonna be really tough for Black to pull off a win. I'm gonna need to find a sub rogue and a survival hunter and queue this on the ladder and see what it's capable of. Just let me know when you're queuing so I can queue up <laughs> <and collect> three <laughs> points. <laughs> you will you will regret this. You will rue the day that you <laughs> underestimated Boomkin survival hunter subtlety rogue, okay? <laughs> yeah. 49 seconds. I actually wonder if if they could get like a speed run kill, you know? If this could be like a record setting fastest game in AWC. I don't think Boom can. Those have been some fast game. games. What is the fastest I, 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 game? I think it's like 20 seconds it, or something, isn't it? I think I might hold the record. Is it really? For Ruins of Lordran and Wrath? Well, How long was that game? Like Lord three Wrath, globals? I mean, gates, it was wolves come out, bloodlust is done, popped, yeah. and Venrikis go down, goes Venrikis. Exactly. It's like three it's globals. It's wolves, it's bloodlust, it's gone. <laughs> That's all it is. But we had some really fast games, I want to say last season, where like they were like under 30, 40 seconds. So, um, yeah, pretty, definitely be some really quick games here. Oh, we'll see if uh, Pirate Pete's, oh, they're, oh, this is even worse, I think. <laughs> like, this is even more difficult for them. <laughs> don't you think? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's no rogue peeling you. You I... can't avoid this damage, though. Yeah. I mean... Anything is hard for them, but I don't. I, I actually wonder if you could kill a boomkin, and the boomkin's not cheap shotting your whole team. I, I mean, maybe they can win. They're actually, oh, they're gonna try a comp. They baited them. They're like, ah, you switched your comp. We had this all along. Rogue Mage Druid. P Mage's gonna be playing that resto dude. Why, I, that would be that super right, funny. Is isn't winning. P Mage normally the mage? I'm wondering if this graphic might not be. Well, have to, I think we have to wait till we zone in. Because if P Mage's actually the healer and NPC is playing the mage. He's normally the hey, warlock, man. so lots of people play different specs now, right? Okay. Like, you used to be. Uh, look at yourself. You used to be the uh, the balance druid. Now, at the tippity top of the ladder on Destro warlock. Like, soul shuffle has given opportunities for people to play lots of different specs. Okay, we'll see. We will see here. Asher means fall. Maybe not the best map pick from Black. <laughs> I mean, unless this is like, imagine they're just insane and like they could have actually just been playing this the whole time. Imagine they win this. They have the most insane game ever. And they could have been playing this the whole time. And then they regret yeah. doing what they've done. Well, maybe they just come back in 3-0. I guess that's true. This this could be the reverse sweep Cinderella story. Healer, disqualified, comeback, P make Resto Druid. It's kind of like that one uh, EU regionals where, um, who was it? I think No Lifer couldn't attend the land, so they had like Frofsy play Mage instead, who played Shadow Priest at the time, and they qualified to BlizzCon <laughs> with him on Mage last second. Yeah. Maybe we can have one happen. of those moments. Yeah, we'll, ha we'll have to wait and see. Just, we're going to Asha Main's fall, and once we get into the game, we'll know for sure. But I feel like this isn't actually the worst matchup here for Black. If they could play this at like a decent level, I think they could get a win. All right, Pete's mixing it up. Uh, maybe they got baited here. Of course, they can always go back. <laughs> they have a few, they have a few uh, rounds to play around with here now that they're up 2-0 in the series, but. I mean, if anything, this is probably a good test for Pirate Peace because they might fight this comp in the future. So maybe Boomkin Lock actually might be a decent pick and they get some information. Who knows? Um, also, we haven't seen Boomkin Lock yet in the tournament. So we can see also, it for the first time. I just realized Pirate Pete's logo is a bunch of orcs dressed as pirates. And that's exactly what they are. <laughs> in every game, that's exactly what they are. The Pirate Pete's. I want to know where they came up with this because Gelu Baba's teams are normally like the Chalky Milkman or something. You know, like... Where did they come up with the pirate thing? Why do they want to be pirates? Is it because of 10.2.6? Is this like a leak in the AWC for 10.2.6? Do they know something we don't know about the pirate patch? I don't know anything, so not sure. Couldn't tell you. Uh, but gates are about to open here for <laughs> map number three. Black's going to be actually bringing in P-Make on the Restoration Druid for this game. And you have NPCs playing the mage. He's got ice oh, wall, no. some ice wall attack. Uh, P is just going to be uh, interrupted here at the beginning of the game, going in for a nature swiftness. And it's looking a little bit sketchy here for P Make in the opening stages, looking for cyclones. He oh, got walled no, on his own grief. clone. <laughs> that's like that's a solo shuffle thing. Oh, this is an absolute nightmare here for NPC. He drops. This is looking this... super sketchy. Corky's is getting a little bit low on health, but it's going to be NPC that falls and. Yeah, that I don't. I don't think Black. I I, I think they're going to be tapping out with that. Pirate Pete's up 3-0 in the series, eliminating Black you know what, from the competition. You know what that made me made me want to see? I want to see. You know how they just came out with like NPC dungeons, where you can join a dungeon group with NPCs and they run the dungeon with you. I want to see those NPCs, like NPCs fight each other. <laughs>
I want to see what, what it looks like if you take, if you took those dungeon NPCs and made them fight each other. Who would win? Okay, right, we got the replay of P make. Wild growth is typically not the best ability to start with, so it's already kind of looking rough. And then obviously the NS when everybody's at full health, not going to be the best second move, obviously. And then getting walled on his own clone in a second here by his I like mage. This wall. Yeah, getting it's walled wall. on his own clone. That would have been on DR from the blind. So, uh, and then the trank because you've been sitting in the middle of the man. Then he cancels it to cast wild growth. Probably not. I mean, their team's obviously in a rough spot. Hopefully, they can figure out something here because uh, I believe that they are in the gauntlet uh, moving forward. Um, but they're going to try and do the best with what they had given to them here for today. And unfortunately, this is going to be it. Yeah, kind of a brutal game. There's not that much to unpack here. Pirate, or Pirate Pete's obviously quite dominant in this series. I think Black, they, they just know they really don't have much of a chance here. So unfortunate for them. Uh, they will be eliminated, and we'll have to see what their standings are at the end of it all um, on Sunday. Uh, but yeah, definitely an interesting one. I think we can talk a little bit about Pirate Pete's. How do you like Corky? Like, how does Corky look today? Obviously, this series has been kind of free for them, but in general, do you think bringing on the balance trade has been a benefit for them? I mean, it's the reason they're in here, I think. They used Rogue Boomkin the entire way through the open bracket. I think Corky being on this team is, like, the main reason that they're in the gauntlet. Yeah. I love this team, personally. You know, bringing back some AWC veterans are kind of just... Uh, as Zika was saying it earlier, you know, they're not, like, super try-harding it. They're they're here for fun. I feel like they've got a really diverse roster. Um, and I'm I don't know, I'm excited to see what they can do. Yeah, me too. To answer um, your question. We'll have to see how far they can get. Uh, it's it's not it's not easy though. Competition is quite difficult this year. We were talking about. I mean, you have like veteran teams like Swapsy. We don't know exactly. I don't know if we have. have we figured out. I don't think we have. We'll we'll talk more about that have later. Which? The standings. I was just wondering, like, do we know where Swapsy kind of falls now? Like, are, are they still in it? They're calc. I know that production will be calculating it right now. Um... So we'll find out. Oh, look, that one. they're fast. All right, well, we got the gauntlet here. So there oh, yeah. is Swapsy's team. Yeah, uh, they're going to be up against Precog and get up the ladder. So if they are able to, you know, beat all those teams, then that's a that's a long road. That's going to be a long day. Yeah, I mean, it definitely is. Precog Enthusiasts and uh, WW Furbogs, they're both extremely good teams. And I could see either one of them actually making it the distance. One little fact is I don't think any team has ever been in that last position and actually made it through the entire gauntlet into the top four. So um, we'll see if they can do it. It'll be uh, making history. Uh, I think for Black, they're obviously going to have to go back to the drawing board and we'll see what they can figure out because you're going to need a healer if you're going to be able to compete. Uh, Pirate Pete's as well, a very difficult team. We've seen them do an incredible job here today and in the open bracket. And then, of course, Ulebang or Chibaki Tensu uh, is going to be that final boss, depending on what happens. Yeah, so I ve definitely excited for this year. This is, of course, Europe. We have to uh, see how the North American uh, gauntlet does shape out. But the winner of that will be moving on to the midseason clash, March second and third. So excited for that. We'll see if uh, maybe we can break that that curse of being sort of first here, uh, precog enthusiast or uh, WW Furbog. So we'll have to see. So uh, exciting day of game so far for, for Europe. And uh, how about North America, though, Super Tease? I mean, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a different story over there. We've got, um, you know, the move, of course, Team Liquid, a lot of familiar faces. Yeah, I mean, North America had a very intense open bracket qualifying phase with a lot of people trying to come in last minute and pulling teams together to try and get into the open bracket. Um, I'm very excited to see how it plays out. A couple teams in, in the lower side, teams like uh, Team Fusion with Naj, Renar, Nazem, and Dopamine. Like, this is like their last chance to really try and earn as many points because we didn't see them in the top eight last week. We have a Rep Paladin team as well. Uh, La Pomp coming in, KZ Fox, who is like a former solo shuffle champion uh, on the Rep Paladin. So they're going to try and give it a run here uh, as well as far as the new teams are concerned. I think the Move and Liquid, they're still remaining dominant. They're probably still going to be kind of the main teams for everybody else to try and take down as a threat. And I'm really curious to see if Void G G um, can kind of match the level of ability that we were really expecting them to hit. Like I was thinking this could be a team that could win the whole thing uh, for North America and they are starting in that upper bracket against Liquid. 
Yeah, I was hoping for for them as well. It is the team that I predicted last week to kind of make it pretty far, but unfortunately didn't quite hold up to that promise. But they certainly do have a chance this time. They're going to have to be Team Liquid, though, and they are looking super strong if we can take anything from how they performed last weekend. And uh, we can also see those teams down there facing elimination. So definitely be tuning in tomorrow for North America. A lot is up in the air as well over there in terms of standings. But real quick, I also do want to give a shout Shout out here to Raider IO. They have they're doing some really cool things over there. There's a lot of good information. They're having a, a permanent database basically of every single match that has been played on AWC. You can look at who won, how long the match was, how deep and dampening, all their specs, all of their gear. So that is just a, an incredible amount of really good information that you can check out. So tremendous shout out to Raider IO for providing us with all of that awesome information. You know, they're giving some PVP love. It's, it's you know, it's obviously they've been uh, a Mythic Plus website for so long, but it's cool that they're coming over here and creating some amazing tools for the PVP scene as well. So thank you so much to Raider IO. Definitely go check that out. Let them know how you feel about it. And with that. I believe we are gonna head out and I am super excited for North America. Hope you guys are too. Definitely follow us on WoW Esports for some more information if you want uh, to be pinged about that. And with that, we'll head out twitch.tv slash Warcraft tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank you everyone so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one.